All right, how's everybody doing today? Hotep, hey, this is Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. It is Sunday, March 10th, 2024, and we are live. Welcome to the African History Network show today, and this is our 14th year anniversary of me broadcasting the African History Network show. And I first started broadcasting on uh, March 10th, 2010, March 10th, 2010. So it's been 14 years. Well, we have a very exciting show today and hopefully everybody can hear me all right. Um, as many of you all know, uh, I was asked to, to deliver a presentation to the uh, Detroit Reparations Task Force on Saturday, March 2nd, 2024. So the turnout was packed. Uh, my presentation blew everybody away. And I was asked to speak about uh, the case for municipal reparations and then also talk some about federal reparations and the difference between the two. And because of, uh, because of time constraints, I can't get through my full presentation. They told me, uh, to do 30 minutes, they let me do 40 minutes and then take Q&A, questions and answers, but I wasn't able to get through uh, all of my slides, the full presentation, because, you know, when I uh, prepare for a topic, I'm well prepared for. It. So people had been asking me about uh, the presentation, things like that. So I said, OK, well, today we'll do uh, the full presentation so I can get through all this information. So this is what we're going to do today. All right. Uh, so give us a thumbs up. Give us a heart. Give us a like on this broadcast. We've got a lot of information to go through. And, you know, on the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world, because right now it's correct wrong behavior. It's not over when Wakanda forever. All right. So the case for reparations. Um, the case for municipal reparations versus federal reparation. All right. And we know there's a lot of information going on, a lot of talk about uh, repairing the damage of a legacy of slavery, Jim Crow segregation, redlining, housing discrimination, et cetera. You know, I just had Robin Rue Simmons on, on our show Monday, uh, February 26, dealing with uh, updates and, um, what's going on with local efforts for reparations across the country. And, you know, Robin Ruth Simmons was the older woman from the fifth ward in Evanston, Illinois, who was the one who spearheaded the um, effort from, uh, by uh, the city council in Evanston, Illinois, to uh, begin the process of repairing the damage of historical racism and discrimination that African-Americans in the small city of Evanston, Illinois, uh, endured. So go watch that presentation. If you go watch that interview I did with her, if you missed that. Okay. Now, and I brought up Evanston here in the uh, presentation as well. Now, anytime I speak, I know I may say some things that are outside the circumference of some people's awareness, just because you never heard this type of information before, or what I'm going to say does not mean it's not true. It just means you have to do some research to understand what I'm talking about. And I learned this from one of my teachers, Dr. Ray Hagens, of, um, of the African Village, okay? And uh, many of you are familiar with Dr. Ray Hagens. All right, now, let's look at this. So seven main things, I think it's seven here, uh, seven main things I want to do with this presentation. Number one, define what reparations are, okay? Because the term reparations is not specific to slavery, even though it's properly used, properly used uh, in reference to slavery, is not specific to slavery. Two, define what mutual repar uh, municipal reparations are. Define what municipal reparations are. And the reason why this is so important is because I spend a lot of time uh, online doing research um, trying to come up with a, trying to find a, a clear working definition of what municipal reparations is. And I really couldn't find it. 
Okay, I looked at numerous sources. I looked at local efforts, things like this. I, I had a under, I had a, an understanding of what municipal reparations was. I interviewed Rob and Ruth Simmons twice. In addition, um, in 2023, she was on uh, Roland Martin Unfiltered, and I happened to be on on that day as well. And I talked to her then also. So um, I put together a working definition of what municipal reparations is. But part of the confusion, I think, is that the term is so new, um, you don't have a working definition or an or there isn't a well-known definition of what municipal reparations is. So then if you can't clearly define what it is that you're talking about, then that leaves open the opportunity for people to just make it into whatever they want it to be, whether it's true or not. And it becomes very ambiguous. It becomes very hard to define it. And if you can't properly define what it is that you're talking about or what it is that you're trying to achieve, it's going to be harder to actually bring it into fruition. So you have to clearly define, you know, what it is that you're talking about. So we'll talk about, uh, we'll define what mus municipal reparations are. And we'll talk about why are municipal reparations uh, a good option? Why are municipal reparations a good option? Now, municipal reparations dealing with local uh, policies, programs at the city level to repair the damage of historic racism, discrimination, et cetera, does not replace the need for federal reparations. Both are needed, okay? But I'm gonna explain why municipal is also needed then we'll talk about what was michigan's history of slavery because i've heard so much about um detroit and slavery and things like this and and, and most of this information that, that i've heard just from people in detroit radio shows things like this uh people haven't really studied the history of slavery in michigan even though slavery did exist in michigan Michigan is not Mississippi, Texas, Alabama, uh, Georgia, anything like that. Michigan does not have a huge history of slavery. And Michigan abolished slavery in 1837 also. Michigan does not have a deep history of slavery. Michigan is not the South, even though slavery did exist. So when you talk about repairing the damage of something, you first have to analyze the, the, the history of what it is you're talking about and the damage that was done to understand what needs to be repaired. All right, now, uh, so we'll do it. Why did Michigan have such few enslaved Africans in comparison to Mississippi and Texas? Then we'll talk about what was the Northwest Ordinance of 1787? Because if you don't understand the Northwest Ordinance of 1787, then you're not going to be able to understand the history of slavery in Michigan and why Michigan had such low numbers. Okay. And then even I was looking at information dealing with New York, even though slavery existed in New York and New York abolished slavery in 1817, and it takes about 10 years for it to really go into effect. You know, in, I think they said about 1790, New York had about 21,000 enslaved Africans, even though it was, a greater proliferation in the state of New York. New York wasn't Mississippi. So when you start talking about municipal reparations, it's designed to repair the damage that the city was responsible for inflicting upon African Americans based upon the policies from the cities, the ordinances, the laws, etc. It's not designed to deal with 400 years of oppression and 246 years of slavery and all the lynchings and things like that. This The city level is not designed to do that. The cities, municipalities don't have the financial wherewithal to address all of that. Okay, so we'll talk about the Northwest Ordinance of 1787, which very few people know about. 
Uh, and then we'll talk about the California Reparations Task Force uh, final report. And I, and I talked about this in the um, presentation I did, the Kwanzaa presentation I did uh, December 26, King Solomon Baptist Church. Um, and part of my uh, uh, 2023 and uh, part of my Kwanzaa presentation, and we we broadcasted it here, broadcast we we uh, rebroadcasted it here on the African History Network numerous times. Part of the presentation was dealing with the final report from the California Reparations Task Force, the one thousand page final report, which includes uh, approximately 115 policy recommendations. And California does not have a deep history of slavery either. They've identified somewhere between 1,500 to 4,000 enslaved African-Americans who were in some type of semi-slavery state. Um, in California, abolished slavery in 1850 when they became a state in the union, uh, number one. So even, but even though California does not have a deep history of slavery, number two, they do have a deep history of housing segregation and housing discrimination, voter suppression, racism against African-Americans, violence inflicted upon them, things of this nature. So when we talk about repairing the damage is not specifically to slavery, although it can include that. That's why you always have to study the history of what happened and the laws and policies put in place to inflict the harm, inflict the damage to understand the laws and policies that have to be put in place to repair the damage. Okay, so uh, we'll talk about the California, California Reparations Task Force final report, which came out June 29th, 2023. And then also we'll talk briefly about Detroit's history of racism against African-Americans as well. Okay, so the original presentation, you know, I was shooting for 30 minutes. It ended up being 40 minutes when I delivered um, this presentation, March 2nd, 2024, for the Detroit Reparations Task Force. Here we have more time, probably do about an hour or something like that. And let, let me say from the outset, as of, as of, uh, uh, let, let me say from the outset, I'm not on the Reparations Task Force, the Detroit Reparations Task Force. I don't speak for them, anything like that. I was asked to come in and do a historical presentation. Somebody saw the, um, the presentation I did for Kwanzaa, and I was getting deep into this history, dealing with uh, repairing the damage and talking about the California Reparations Task Force, et cetera. Uh, and they they gave it to somebody with the task force. They contacted me uh, and asked me to come in and do a presentation. All right. Now, if you want to contact me, you can do so through our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Um, you can contact me, email me through the website, or you can also email me at ahnshow at theafricanhistorynetwork.com, ahnshow at theafricanhistorynetwork.com. If you need to get in contact with me, because people have been asking me questions about the history, about repairing the damage um, at the local level. So I have been getting calls about that and inquiries about that. All right, so let's jump into this. All right. So when we look at the term reparations, right, historically, the term reparations was not specific to slavery. When we look at the term reparations historically, and this is information that comes from Britannica.com, Encyclopedia Britannica. Reparations was a levy on a defeated country, forcing it to pay some of the war costs of the winning countries, forcing it to pay some of the war costs of the winning countries. Reparations were levied on the central powers after World War I. So World War I was um, 1914 to 1918, okay, uh, World War I. And this was to compensate the allies for some of their war costs. They, uh, they were meant to replace war indemnity, indemnities, which had been levied after earlier wars as a punitive measure, as well as to compensate for economic losses. After World War II, it was basically 1939 and 1945, the Allies levied reparations princip principally on Germany, Italy, Japan, and Finland. 
Okay. So historically speaking, we see reparations paid from one country to another country for a war, to repair some type of damage that was done, some type of conflict, etc. Later, the meaning of the term became more inclusive. Later, the, the meaning of the term reparations became more inclusive. It was applied to the payments undertaken by the Federal Republic of Germany to the state of Israel for war crimes after the Jews, um, against the Jews in territory controlled by the Third Reich or the Nazis and to individuals in Germany and outside it to in indemnify them for their persecution. The term reparations was also applied to obligations of Israel to the Arab, Arab refugees who suffered property losses after Israel's victory over the Arab states in 1948. Okay. So, and this deals with um, also um, the uh, setting up the um, state of Israel as well in 1948 and um, um, Arabs being displaced from Palestine. Okay, so you can read more about this, reparations uh, 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 reparations at Britannica.com, reparations at Britannica.com. And actually, um, we can uh, post a link here for it also. All right, now let's continue here. All right. Now, what, what are reparations when it pertains to African Americans? Okay. So, to look at a working definition of this, um, uh, cited uh, in Cobra's uh, website. Now, this is not a uh, endorsement of one reparations organization over another because I don't belong to any of them. So I, I don't belong to none of them. So this is not an endorsement of one over the other. And I've had different reparations advocates here on the African History Network show over the course of the 14 years that I've been broadcasting this show. But the National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America, also known as NCOBRA, defines reparations as a process of repairing, healing, and restoring a people injured because of their group identity and in violation of their fundamental human rights by governments, corporations, institutions, and families. Now, reparations deals with repairing, the, now this is, this is me summarizing this, reparations deals with repairing damage that was done, making one whole again. The concept, uh, and I'll show you um, Merriam-Webster as well, okay? The, 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 con the root concept of reparations means to repair the damage that was done to make someone whole again, to, res to, to restore them to a state before the damage was done. All right, let's continue here. Now, those groups that have been injured have the right to obtain from the government, corporation, institution, or family responsible for the injuries that which they need to repair and heal themselves. Okay, so this is from Encobra's website, their official website. In addition to being a demand for justice, it is a principle of international human rights law. As a remedy, as a remedy, it is similar to the remedy for damages in domestic law that holds a person responsible for injuries suffered by another when the infliction of the injury violates domestic law. So basically it's dealing with repairing the damage of some harm that was done and making you whole again, restoring you to a point before that harm was done. Now, examples of groups that have obtained reparations include Jewish victims of the Nazi Holocaust. We know that um, Germany set up a pension of um, $90 billion uh, for Jewish Holocaust survivors. And there are approximately uh, 130,000 Jewish Holocaust survivors that live in the U.S. Okay. So this would be an example of that. And I have an article 
from New York Times. So just so just so people understand, this is my reparations file, folks. This is my let me get you, let me see this right here. I don't play with this type of stuff. This is my reparations file, folks. Okay, so I've been studying this for a minute. And those that you know watch the African History Network show see me, you know, I've got this is okay, so right next to me. You know, I monitor about 35 different news sources on a daily basis. I do constant research. This is 50% of one stack of articles I have next to me. I have two stacks of articles next to me. That's just on the that's just on the desk. I got one, two, three, three stacks of articles on the floor, okay, that are about two feet tall. So I don't play with this type of information. This is serious business. All right, let's go back to this. All right, so when you ask me to do a presentation for you, I'm, I'm coming with the facts and evidence. I don't play games. Um, okay, Jewish victims of the Nazi Holocaust, Japanese Americans interned in concentration camps in the United States during World War II. I've got some information on that because I hear... Even at the meeting, there were there were you know some people who came from the general public, and during the presentation, I had to explain what happened and how the Jewish American, how the Japanese Americans got over one point six billion dollars because the uh, um, what a lot of people think happened and who they think it went to is not what happened. That's why you always have to do the research. Proper documentation ends all conversation. Well, I'll, I'll show you that in just a minute. Um, United States during World War II, Alaska natives for land, labor, and resources taken. Victims of the massacre in Rosewood, Florida, January, uh, January uh, 1923, Rosewood, Florida, and their descendants, Rosewood, Florida, and their descendants. Um, I don't know how many of you actually saw the presentation I did dealing with Rosewood, Florida, and the movie. And uh, the movie came out, I think it was 1997, directed by John Singleton. It starred Ving Rhames, Esther Rowe, you know, Thelma, Ev I mean, uh, Florida Evans from Good Times. I know Thelma, I know Bernadette Stannis. I've interviewed her twice on the African on the African History Network show. But uh, uh, Florida Evans, Esther Rowe, uh, Don Cheeto, John Voight, okay? Really good movie. A lot of fiction in the movie because the uh, lead character played by Ving Rhames uh, the character of man, um, he didn't historically exist. He was probably a composite character, which was a uh, a character, a fictitious character created that embodies actions done by numerous real historical people. Man didn't exist, but you, but because of what happened, and because uh, it, it, uh, Rosewood was a city of about two hundred African Americans, there was one white family that lived in the city middle-class African-American city. They own land, own homes, things like this. They were, all of them were ran out of the city of Rosewood, Florida. Their land was taken by the white people that lived in the uh, town right outside of Rosewood. And the city of Rosewood, Florida was removed from the maps. This is what happened in Rosewood. The city of Rosewood, Florida was removed from the maps. So there's a deep history behind that. Uh, Native Americans as a remedy for violations uh, of treaty uh, treaty rights and political uh, dissenters in Argentina and their descendants. Okay, so for more information on this, go to Encobra's official website, officialencobraonline.org, okay? Officialencobraonline.org. Now, once again, this is not an endorsement of one organization over another because I don't, I don't belong to none of them. Okay. And uh, it's probably safe to say I got disagreements with a lot of them, but I, I don't belong to any of them. So this is, I'm, we're just trying to get a working, just a basic understanding of this. All right. Now, if we look here at, um, Miriam Webster, okay, just just getting a basic understanding of reparations and different ways that it was used. 
uh okay webster.com miriam webster online let's look at this here okay uh reparation um a repairing or keeping in repair uh the act of making amends offering expiation or giving satisfaction for a wrong or injury something done or giving as amends or satisfaction uh third definition the payment of damages okay indemnification specifically compensation in money or materials payable by a defeated nation for damages to or expenditures sustained by another nation as a result of hostilities with the defeated nation okay so you can read this also uh more information on uh reparations all right let's continue all right let's go back to the powerpoint presentation give us a thumbs up give us a heart give us a like on this broadcast be sure to follow us on our social media platforms now what are municipal reparations what are municipal reparations now like i said at the beginning of the broadcast um i searched and could not find a clear-cut definition for municipal reparations and one of the reasons i think is because the term is so new there is no you know clear-cut defined definition i talked to robin ruth simmons um about it who and, and, and when i interviewed her on uh march uh february 26 when i interviewed her on february 26 you know we discussed it and she explained what it was so in looking at a number of different sources and looking at different programs things like this this is the working definition that I came up with that really explains what people are trying to accomplish. So municipal reparations deals with using policies, ordinances, et cetera, at the local city level, the local city level to repair the damage of discriminatory policies the city used to inflict harm upon a specific population. In this case, we're talking about African-Americans. Okay, once again, municipal is referring to local cities, the city level. Municipal reparations deals with using policies, ordinances, et cetera. Uh, it could be executive orders from the mayor, things like this. At the local city level to repair the damage of discriminatory policies the city used to inflict harm upon a specific population. Okay, now, if we look here, just for a, a point of reference, right? Um, it, the city of Detroit's website, they have uh, information dealing with the uh, Detroit Reparations Task Force, okay? And I just wanna show this to you because a, a lot of times people come to these discussions with um, not the proper information, not the proper framing, okay? Now, once again, I don't speak for the reparations task force, anything like that. I was asked to do a presentation to them. Um, so this is at uh, the city of Detroit's website, DetroitMI.gov, DetroitMI.gov, okay? And you can look this up for yourself. I'll, I'll post the link here. Uh, reparations task force. And it's important to understand their purpose. The city, I'm trying to, the font is... Um, the font type is faint, but it says the city of Detroit reparations task force is a 13 member body consisting of four executive members appointed by uh, city council president, uh, Mary Sheffield and nine general members. So this was a, a, an initiative that was put on the ballot in Detroit and it got over 80% approval by Detroiters, overwhelmingly African-American Detroiters. Okay. So this is how this came about. This was a, an initiative put on the ballot. The task force will develop will develop recommendations for housing and economic development programs that address historical discrimination against the black community in Detroit. OK, 
So that's so that's the that's the charge of the task force. The charge is not to deal with 400 years of racism in, in America. So when you read the resolution, OK, from the city and, and, and from uh, City Council President uh, Mary Sheffield, they do acknowledge all that. But that's not the charge of the task force. The charge of the task force is not to make up for 400 years of oppression. OK, it, specifically. The task force will develop recommendations for housing and economic development programs that address historical discrimination against the black community in Detroit. OK, so that's the of this. And, and, and I say that because a lot of times people, so many people, they may mean well, but they'll come to task force in various cities with a whole laundry list of problems and trying to correct the last 400 years or 246 years of slavery or, or decades of Jim Crow segregation and lynchings and redlining and all that stuff. And it's like, whoa, whoa hold on. This, you have to look at what the purpose of the task force in any city is, not specifically Detroit, but any city. You always have to look and see what their purpose is. Okay, now, municipal reparations deals with the city repairing the damage the city was responsible for causing not repairing the damage the federal government was responsible for generally speaking okay cities don't have those type of resources to 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 repair the the the, the harm that the federal government did in general they're going to repair the harm that the city was responsible for now in the case of evanston illinois and we talked about Evanston extensively here on the on the African History Network show. And in preparation for my interview with Robin Ruth Simmons, my first interview with her, I think it was 2021 when I first interviewed her. Um, I read a lot of the 70 page harm study that local historian uh, Dino Robinson did on behalf of city council. And when you study municipal reparations, one of the things that has to happen is that a harm study has to take place. You have to study the history of what happened in that city and the laws and policies that were used to inflict harm upon African-Americans to know what laws and policies need to be put in place to repair the damage. And with Evanston, Evanston was founded in 1853. Slavery was abolished in the state of Illinois in 1818. When you go study the history of Evanston, Evanston does not have a history of slavery. Evanston, Illinois was founded almost four decades after slavery was abolished in the state of Illinois. But, but Evanston had a deep history of housing discrimination, other, other types of discrimination, racism, but a deep history of housing discrimination going back somewhere to the about, about the late 1800s or so. And in Evanston, they still have African-Americans who are alive today who were victims of housing discrimination in 1950s, 60s, things of this nature. So reparations and so in the case of Evanston, Illinois, they did not have a history of slavery, but did have a rampant history of housing discrimination, reparations and any process for restorative relief must connect between the harm imposed upon us uh, upon a specific group and the city the strongest case for reparations by the city of evanston illinois is in the area of housing where there is sufficient evidence showing the city's part in housing discrimination as a result of early city zoning ordinances in place between 1919 and 1969 when the city when the city banned housing discrimination so you have the fair housing act of 1968 right that passes uh and signed in the law shortly after uh dr martin luther king jr is assassinated and then in 1969 evanston illinois banned housing discrimination now for more information on this go to cityofevanston.org cityofevanston.org and they have a section there dealing with uh reparations at the city level also when i interviewed robin ruth simmons on february 26 monday february 26 2024 she said that 
they have obtained an additional $10 million in funding. So they're also giving cash payments uh, for uh, to go towards purchasing a house or housing repairs. Uh, they're giving cash payments to people who choose the cash payment option also. All right, let's continue. All right, and if you have any questions, you can post them here. Be sure to uh, visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. We're going to continue here in just a minute, but be sure to visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, and register for the online history classes that I teach on Saturdays, um, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, what they didn't teach you in school. This is a 10-week online history course that I teach. We had a great class on Saturday, March 9th. As soon as you register, you can uh, watch that class we did. Uh, the class lesson plan for all 10 uh, class sessions is, is right here. So you can review the class lesson plan, download it here. We have a preview of the class uh, here, I did an uh, overview as well. But we did deal with thousands of years of history and what leads up to slave trade taking place. Next classes are Saturday, March 16th, March 23rd, March 30th, and April 6th. So usually teach the class uh, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived. They're recorded. You can go back and watch it any time. Click right here on register here to register for the class. And even after the course is over with, you can go back and watch the entire class. You don't lose access. Okay. The content is PG-13. Uh, so you can use this with uh, your, your children, young adults also. Uh, we have information here for the African History Network show as well and how to listen to audio podcasts. And our um, PayPal and Cash App information is here. So I got to move it uh, up to the top of the page right here. So if you want to support the African History Network, we're celebrating our 14th year anniversary of me broadcasting the African History Network show through Cash App, dollar sign, the AHN show, S H O W. We have the link here, it takes you to our QR code. Um, I started broadcasting March 10th, 2010. So this is our actual 14th year anniversary and our paypal information paypal.me forward slash the ahn show so thanks for all the support throughout the years this is uh a lot of hard work a lot of uh takes a lot to run african history network all right so let's continue and i'm going to post this information here also okay all right now Continuing the discussion dealing with uh, municipal reparations. So compared to federal and state governments, courts or private institutions, municipalities are the most suitable site for reparations, okay? Or repairing the damage. Now, I really don't, now, as I said uh, in my, um, presentation to the Detroit Reparations Task Force. I wouldn't put the term reparations on anything that you actually want to get passed, especially if white people have to vote for it. I know we have some white allies, things like that, but um, especially at the federal level, the, I would not put the term reparations on anything that you actually want to get passed, especially at the federal level. Because the majority of the people have to vote on it at the federal level, and you can say it in, in most state legislatures also, majority of the people have to vote on this at the federal level are white. There are 435 members of the House of Representatives. We we make up only about 12 percent of the House seats, and the Black Republicans don't count because no Black Republicans support reparations. Byron Donalds out of Florida doesn't support it. Uh, Burgess Owens out of Utah doesn't support it. John James out of uh, Detroit suburbs, uh, doesn't support it. And then in the Senate, Senator Tim Scott doesn't support reparations. He's already said he's going to vote against reparations. He didn't even vote for the for the uh, John Lewis Voting Rights Act. And Senator Tim Scott is the one who blocked the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act when it came to the negotiation between he on behalf of the Senate and uh, Republicans in the Senate and Senator Cory Booker on behalf of Democrats in the Senate and, rep and then Representative Karen Bass uh, represented Democrats in the House. The bill had already passed the House of Representatives by a vote of 220 to 212, March 3rd, 2021. Karen Bass is now the uh, mayor of Los Angeles, California. Senator Tim Scott is the one who blocked the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. He voted against Judge Katanji Brown Jackson's 
uh, Supreme Court nomination. So he's the only black Republican in the Senate. If if the black Republican doesn't support reparations, how many white Republicans you think support reparations? None in the House or the Senate. So I wouldn't put the term reparations on anything that you actually want to get passed, especially if white people have to vote for it. Why? Because we're in a climate right now where you have an attack on diversity, equity, and inclusion. You had the, the lawsuit filed by Ed Bloom, conservative, white conservative activist Ed Bloom, that uh, struck down uh, affirmative action when it comes to college admissions. You have the lawsuit that Ed Bloom has filed against the Fearless Fund, uh, a group of African-American uh, women who provide um, funding for women of color businesses. OK, now in the lawsuit that Ed Bloom filed, he said that the 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 uh, funding is only for uh, black female businesses, which is which is false. We, we talked to the uh, to the founders on Roland Martin Unfiltered. For those who don't know, I'm on Roland Martin Unfiltered almost every Friday, been on almost every Friday since October 2020 uh, as a panelist providing historical and political analysis. So they, they said that, no, this is for women of color. It's not only for African-American women. So you have the attack on diversity, equity, and inclusion. You have the attack on things like the Fearless Fund. You have the uh, attack on critical race theory, which was really launched by Donald Trump in September of 2020, unfortunately, when, when he was president. And this was a executive order that he did that banned using critical race theory in training for federal employees, okay? Um, there was a article by NBCnews.com that everybody needs to read. And this deals with how, uh, what's the name of it? How Trump ignited the fight how Trump ignited the fight over critical race theory in schools, how Trump ignited the fight over critical race theory in schools. OK, and when you look at this article, this article is from uh, May 10th, 2021. I have a I have a huge file on critical race theory as well. So if you have seen the African History Network show, especially when I was on five days a week uh, and you saw the stories that we dealt with um, attacks on critical race theory across the country you know i have uh where's that article where's that file folder let me see if i can put my hands on it. oh no it's at the bottom of a stack okay so i can't reach it but how trump ignited the fight over critical race theory in schools and very quickly here when we look at this it talks now this is from may 10th 2021 and it talks about um, the proposed policies mimic former President Donald Trump's September memo. So it was September 2020. Okay. September, uh, say, yeah, September 20. Trump's September 2020 memo ordering the Office of Management and Budget to stop funding training on critical race theory for federal employees, calling it a quote unquote propaganda effort. Okay. Now this was before six months before Christopher Rufo, the white conservative activist, Christopher Rufo. This is before he put out his series of tweets talking about how they planned to redefine what critical race theory is. Uh, and they're basically lying about it because it, now a lot of these Republicans can't tell you what critical race theory is. They know they just don't like it. All right. Around the same time, he condemned Donald Trump, condemned the 1619 Project, a Pulitzer Prize winning 2019 New York Times led uh, report led by reporter Nicole Hannah Jones that holds America was truly founded not in 1776, but in 1619 when the first enslaved African people were brought to the colonies. Educators embraced this message and began utilizing the project and looking for resources to teach a more holistic history of the country. Now you've heard my criticisms about the 1619 Project. There is some good information in there, as well as when I interviewed historian Dr. Errol Scott 
formerly of Howard University, who's now at Morgan State University, he talked about his issues with the um, 1619 Project as well. So go back and watch those uh, interviews I did with him, Daryl with one R, uh, and we get into it. Trump rebuked the, pro the 1619 Project as a warped, distorted, quote unquote, warped, distorted, end quote, portrayal of American history. Both the memo attacking critical race theory, banning critical race theory and uh, being used uh, in training for federal employees and this attack on the 1619 project sparked the commission of the 1776 report, which Donald Trump commissioned the 1776 report, which took an ahistorical or false his historical perspective to American history. And the 1776 report was meant to combat the contents of the 1619 project. The countrywide uprisings in the wake of George Floyd's death only fueled the matter with pundits debating the nation's fraught history of racism. Thus, although President Joe Biden reversed Trump's initial ban in January of 2021 because Biden removed the 1776 project from WhiteHouse.gov and disbanded the 1776 uh, commission, okay? Although President Joe Biden reversed Trump's initial ban in January, January 2021, the seed had been planted. The seed had been planted, okay? So read the rest of, read the rest of this article here. This gives background information on this whole uh, anti-critical race theory attack. Now, then you have Christopher Rufo, who in uh, let me post this link here. Then you have Christopher Rufo, who in 2021 he put out this tweet, and let me bring this up here. Hold on, where is it? Just a second, I've got it here. Okay, so now we want to share screen and go right here. There we go. All right. So, this is what he said. The goal is to have the public read something crazy in the newspaper and immediately think, quote unquote, critical race theory and immediately think, quote unquote, critical race theory. He said we have decodified the term and will recodify it to annex the entire range of cultural constructions that are unpopular with Americans. Now, this tweet was from March 15th, 2021. March 15, 2021, about six months after Donald Trump, who was then unfortunately President Trump, about uh, six months after uh, his uh, memo banning critical race theory when it comes to training uh, federal employees. All right. Now, what Christopher Rufo is talking about here is conservatives redefining what critical what critical race theory is to use it as an umbrella term to be a catch-all term for anything dealing with racism that they don't like uh dealing with the history of slavery um diversity equity and, and inclusion all different types of things like this they're using it as a catch-all term to just use this critical race theory now critical race theory developed in the late 1960s, right around 1968 or so, architects of it were people like Derek Bell from Harvard and others, Kimberly Crenshaw, things of this nature. And it is a legal analysis that is usually taught in graduate schools and law school. It's not taught in K through 12. It's not taught in kindergarten through 12th grade. And it's designed to understand how is it after the civil rights movement after a civil rights act in 1964 voting rights act in 1965 african-americans had not made 
more progresses or as much progress as we should have. And it's, it's analyzing the laws and policies to see how they perpetuate racism. That's what critical race theory is designed to do, to then understand what has to be undone. So it's a it's a legal analysis. OK, it's a legal analysis. All right. OK, let's continue. So see, when I did my presentation, I didn't have a chance to go deep into it like this and didn't have a chance to show the tweet from Christopher Rufo. I mentioned the tweet, but I didn't have a chance to show it on the screen. All right, let's continue here. All right. Now, compared to federal and state pro and state governments, courts or private institutions, municipalities are the most suitable site for reparations. Well, why is that? I'm glad you asked that question. Of the various levels of government, they are the proper locus for two reasons. First, as Howard University political scientist, Dr. Niambi Carter explains, and I know Niambi, we've been on uh, panels on Roland Martin Unfiltered a few times. Um, as she explains, there is a political will for reparations present in municipalities or local cities that is absent at the gridlocked state and federal level, that is absent at the gridlock, gridlocked state and federal levels. She said, quote, it's really local activists and local actors, members of city councils who are empowered in ways in their small communities to do things and to act outside of what the state would do and even the nation would do, okay? So when we have African-American majority city councils, right? When we have African-American majority city councils in cities that are majority African-American or have a large African-American population, right? It was the African-American community that voted and put them in power put them in office. So you have to utilize the power that you have while you have it to help repair the damage done to the people who voted to put you in office. If you're not going to do that, what the hell good are you? You have to use the power that you have while you have it. Okay. So municipal reparations is definitely needed. There's a number of reasons why municipal reparations is definitely needed, but that does not that that does not absolve the need for reparations at the federal level or repairing the damage or reparative justice at the federal level. But at the local level, there's more control and it can be pushed more at the local level. So you need both. By contrast, former uh, U.S. Representative John Conyers, the Honorable John Conyers here in Detroit, the uh, uh, congressional district, he introduced a reparations bill in every session of Congress from 1989 until his passing in October 2019. But these bills never came to a vote. OK, the, 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 the farthest H.R. 40 has made it is being voted out of a house subcommittee in i think it was 2020 uh not 20, not 2020 i think it's 2019 around 2019 it was voted out of a house subcommittee okay that's the farthest that has made it okay it, uh, i can't remember which year it was it's what it hasn't gone anywhere since then since john Kearns passed away representative sheila jackson lee of Texas has taken up the charge of pushing HR 40, which is a bill designed to create a commission to study the history of reparations and the harm, the, the, I'm sorry, to study the history of slavery in this country and the harm done to African Americans and then make recommendations. Okay. Now, you have some people that are trying to force President Joe Biden to do an executive order 
to create a commission to study slavery, the harm done to African Americans, and then make recommendations. As I told Robin Ruth Simmons, when I interviewed her uh, Monday, February 26, 2024, I said, that's a waste of time and you don't need that. The reason why is, is you, you should take that 1000 page report that the California Reparations Task Force uh, did, because they've basically done almost all the work that's needed to push something at the federal level. They've basically done it. Take that report, take that 115 policy recommendations that they've made and craft uh, versions of those policy recommendations at the federal and state level. You don't need another study because when you go look at the when you go look at the report and here's the executive summary of the report. They tell you they explain to you what happened nationally. OK, and they explain to you what happened specifically in the state of California. But they show you what happened. They laid out 12 harms and they show how how those 12 harms impacted African Americans across the country and then specifically how those 12 harms hurt African Americans in the state of California now now you don't need a commission formed to do another study and once you do the study any policy recommendations have to be passed by what the House of Representatives and the US Senate And you don't have votes in the House of the Senate for anything starting with an R. <laughs> Let me put it like to, to you like that. Especially this 118th Congress controlled by Republicans. They can't even pass a budget. They just passed their third continuing resolution. I think they're on. They can't even pass a federal budget. OK, so when you look at this, now this is the. Uh, uh, oh, this is the full report i wanted the executive summary but anyway uh this is the page report they go through and they take you through this part part here is the executive summary but this is the full report uh this is at oag.ca.gov oag.ca.gov office of attorney general california oag.ca.gov executive summary the california reparations report but this is the full 1000 1080 page report um they go through and they lay out the 12 harms and if we look here they talk about um scholars estimate that up to 1500 enslaved african americans lived in california in 1852 they go through and uh talk about okay racial terror they go through and lay out the 12 harms and what happened nationally uh, they talk about enslavement um let's see let's scroll down some more okay racial terror political disenfranchisement they show you what happened nationally then they go through and then they talk about what happened specifically in uh the state of california they talk about housing segregation uh separate and un separate and unequal education nationwide non-white school districts get 23 uh uh national nationally non-white school districts get 23 billion dollars less than predominantly white school districts uh, they talk about California in 1874. The California Supreme Court ruled that segregation in the state's public schools was legal, a decision that predated the U.S. Supreme Court's uh, infamous separate but equal case, uh, Plessy versus Ferguson, 22 years later. Uh, they talk about uh, Brown versus Board of Education. After Brown versus Board of Education, uh, many white dominated school boards throughout the country actively resisted integration in the south in the in the south segregation was still in place through the early 1970s due to massive resistance by white communities in the rest of the country including california including california education segregation occurred when governments 
supported residential segregation coupled with school assignment and sitting policies. Because children attended the schools in their neighborhood and school financing, school financing was tied to property taxes. Most African-American children attended segregated schools with less funding and resources than schools attended by white children. Okay, but, but they talk about uh, how African-Americans were discriminated against when it came to buying homes, housing segregation. So housing segregation was number five. OK, and they talk about the, the redlining that took place, which was created by the federal government. Uh, and they deal with. Let's see here. They talk about uh, Herbert Hoover, who became president in 1928. That's, that's what started the Lily White movement in 1928, which was the effort by Republicans to get Herbert Hoover elected as president. And Republicans appealed to uh, Southern segregation as Democrats in five former Confederate states. So this is when Republicans started pushing African Americans out of the Republican Party, and we started slowly going over to the Democratic Party. As President Herbert Hoover stated in 1931, single-family homes were quote expressions of racial longing, expre expressions of racial longing, and quote that our people should live in their own homes is a sentiment deep in the heart of our race, end quote. The passage of the Fair Housing Act in 1968 outlawed housing discrimination, but did not fix the structures put in place by 100 years of discriminatory government policies. Residential segregation continues today. The average urban African-American person in 1890 lived in a neighborhood that was only 27 percent African-American. In 2019, America is as segregated as it was in the 1940s, with the average urban African-American living in a neighborhood that is 44 percent African-American. Better jobs, tax dollars, municipal services, healthy environments, uh, good schools, access to health care and grocery stores have followed white residents to the suburbs, leaving concentrated poverty, underfunded schools, collapsing infrastructure, polluted water. And polluted water and air, crime and food deserts in segregated inner city neighborhoods. So they're talking about the harm coming from housing segregation, which is dealing with policies, policies from the federal government as well as from the state. Because redlining was created by the federal government right around 1937, coming from the Homeowners Loan Corporation. The federal government used redlining to, to deny African-Americans equal access to the capital needed to buy a single family home at the same time that it subsidized white Americans efforts to own the same type. On the same type of home. OK, OK, so that's that's from page uh, nine of the executive summary. All right. So then they talk about the homeowners loan corporation. Page 10. The Federal government financed many whites, many whites only neighborhoods throughout the state. OK, throughout the state of California, the, the Federal Homeowners Loan Corporation, the HOLC, the Homeowners Loan Corporation maps used in redlining describe many Californian neighborhoods in racially discriminatory, racially discriminatory terms. OK. All right. So read the rest of this here. But they go through and they take you and lay out. In the executive summary, all the 12 harms, racism in it, racism in environment and infrastructure, racism in environment and infrastructure. Due to residential segregation, African-Americans have lived in poor quality housing. Poor quality housing throughout American history exposing them to disproportionate amounts of lead poisoning and increasing their risks of infectious disease. Segregated African-American neighborhoods have more exposure to hazardous waste, oil and gas production, and automobile and diesel fumes, and are more likely to have inadequate public services like sewage lines and water pipes. African-Americans are more vulnerable than white Americans to the dangerous effects of extreme weather patterns like heat waves, like heat waves worsened by the effects of climate change. 
And one of the things that they talk about in their 115 policy recommendations is how in African-American communities, they are um, less likely to have um, to, less likely to have trees. OK, and there was a and, that, and that's a result of the largely the, the uh, urban renewal in the U.S. Interstate Highway Acts of 1952 and 1956 that drive 41,000 miles of U.S. interstate highways all across the country and they run through about 1,600 African-American communities. Well, what happens is when they talk about heat waves and when we deal with heat-related deaths, the African-American community uh, is typically has uh, temperatures of about five degrees higher than in the suburbs because of a lack of trees. Trees provide shade and trees help to purify the air as well. So then you deal with more heat related illnesses and possibly heat related deaths in the African American community. Uh, so this article here from um, National Public Radio, NPR.org, talks about this Bring, bringing back trees to forest cities, wet lined areas helps residents and the and the climate bringing back trees to forest cities red lined areas helps residents and the climate now this is from june 23rd 2021 okay and in here um they talk about the lack of trees reflects some of her neighborhood's problems mount pleasant was hard hit as people and money left for the suburbs over the past 50 years quote we have a lot of abandoned homes um, and when they went through and tore down all the abandoned homes they also tore down the trees on the curb uh, let's see there is a as the globe as the globe heats up cities across America are taking a fresh look at their trees they keep urban neighborhoods cooler they keep urban neighborhoods cooler make air conditioning bills manageable because also in the African-American community, it's um, the the uh, energy bills in the summertime tend to be higher because of a lack, lack of trees in higher temperatures in our communities. They keep urban neighborhoods cooler, make air conditioning bills manageable, and most importantly, protect lives during heat waves, protect lives during heat waves. They help capture stormwater runoff. And as trees grow, they remove heat trapping carbon dioxide from the air. OK, as trees grow, they remove heat trapping carbon dioxide from the air. Some cities are now moving to increase their tree canopy in part to shield against the worst effects of climate change. OK, so read the rest of this article. I don't time to get through all of this. OK, those efforts are also aimed at attacking long-standing economic and, and racial inequality. Long-standing economic and racial inequity, I should say. Researchers have found that low-income neighborhoods generally have fewer trees than wealthy ones. All right, read, read the rest of this. This is way beyond a check, okay? This is why... This is why when I talk to these ha hashtag check people and lay this stuff out, they don't know what to say. This is way beyond the check. You have to first analyze the harm that was done, the laws and policies put in place to understand the laws and policies that have to be put in place to repair the damage. This when you when you start reading the California Reparations Task Force, their final report, if you just read the executive summary, that's 74 pages. You'll see this is this is much deeper than a check. OK, I'm going to post the link here. All right, right there. All right, let's continue. Give us a thumbs up. Give us a heart. Give us a like on this broadcast. Be sure to follow us on our social media platforms. All right. Now. By contrast, former uh, U.S. Representative John Conyers introduced a reparations bill in every session of Congress from 1989 until his passing in, in October 2019, but these bills never came to a vote. 
And although President Joe Biden indicated his support for a reparations commission, any sudden action is unlikely. It's not going to happen. I'm telling you now that it ain't going to happen. Take the take that California reparations task force and craft policies at the federal, state and local level. OK, you don't you don't need another commission. You don't need another study because we're going to get studied to death and go back and look at the Kerner Commission report from 1968, because the Kerner Commission report laid it out also. Pre now, now, President Lyndon Bays Johnson accepted the report, but did not accept a lot of the conclusions. We talk about this in, um, I deal with this in, in my online history classes. If we look at, and I was on a, uh, I was on a panel discussion in, I think it was April of 2023, uh, Environmental Justice Alliance of Michigan, and it was dealing with the Kerner Commission report, okay, and the results of it. If we look at this quickly here from blackpass.org, blackpass.org, they have about 6,000 pages of articles dealing with African-American history and African history. 1967 National Advisory Commission on Civil Disorders, the Kerner Commission report. So it's named after um, uh, Governor Illinois, uh, Governor Otto von Kerner, uh, Otto Kerner, uh, Governor in Illinois. That's where it comes from, right? So it was designed to analyze the rebellions that were taking place um, in 23 cities across the country. They were taking place from 1964 to 1967. And it was designed to answer three questions. President Lyndon Baines Johnson charged the commission with answering three questions. What happened? Why did it happen? What, what can be done to prevent racial disturbance in the future? What happened? Why did it happen? What can be done to um, prevent racial disturbance in the future? In order to answer these questions, the Kerner Commission surveyed 23 cities across the nation which experienced a racial rebellion, okay? They found that the racial disturbances were, were not the result of a single triggering event, but that in all cities surveyed, African-Americans experienced severe economic and social disadvantages compared to whites. Also, the report noted that the riots were not the result of any conspiracy. Rather, they were a response to what the report identified as the racial attitudes and behaviors of white Americans toward African Americans. They were the result of, of white America's racist attitudes towards African Americans. This is what the Kerner Commission report found. In responding to why the rebellions occurred, the Kerner report pointed to black Americans' frustration and feelings of powerlessness regarding extremely high rates of unemployment and underemployment poverty, high rates of police brutality, and inadequate public services. The report continued that a largely poor black population was confined to the central cities while a predominantly white population moved out. And that the racism of white Americans, the racism of white Americans was quote, essentially responsible for the explosive mixture, end quote, leading to the uprisings. Now, this is what the Kerner Commission report found. The racism of white Americans was quote, essentially responsible for the explosive mixture, end quote, leading to the uprisings, okay? Answering what can be done to prevent this in the future. The Kerner Commission suggested that the federal government intervene, intervene to improve housing, improve education, improve employment opportunities and social services for African-Americans. Also to dismantle discriminatory practices in education, employment and discriminatory practices in the police force. And also I would say hiring in the police force as well and criminal courts. President Lyndon Baines Johnson accepted the report but did not support the conclusions and minimal efforts were made to address the problems identified by the commission. Now, also at the same time, he was dealing with the Vietnam War and the Vietnam War took a lot of attention away from like nationally and in the news media, 
the Vietnam War took attention away from the civil rights movement and the plight of African Americans. And Dr. King talks about this in uh, an interview. It was a 26 minute interview that NBC News did with him. And I think it was. I think it was uh, March or April of 1967. OK, March or April 1967. And. Um, in 2018. NBC News, uh, they digitally remastered the uh, interview and re-released it, okay, and re-released it. So everybody should check. Uh, everybody should check this out. I'm gonna see if I can find this. And the name of the interview is. Um, I got to have to find it. Uh, it is. I got so many um, bookmarks for Dr. King here. Which one is that? This is um, on YouTube. I have to find it. Uh, Hold on, let's see. NBC News. It was a 26 minute interview. Uh, this is it. Is this NBC News? Well, yeah, it must be NBC News website or YouTube channel. It has 2.4 million views. Okay, this one right here. MLK talks new phase of civil rights struggle 11 months before his assassination. This was from, uh, he was at Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta. This is from, so I think this is from May uh, 1967. Everybody, everybody go watch this interview. This will blow you away. And he talks about how um, because Dr. King talks about because of this, uh, because of the Vietnam War, how it's harder to get attention on the civil rights movement. OK. So this this one right here. MLK talks new phase of civil rights struggle. 11 months before his assassination, NBC News. This is that NBC News YouTube channel. Go watch this interview. I'm not going to play any of it here because I'm going to get flagged by uh, um, YouTube. So what happened with the Kerner Commission report, Johnson did very little with it and did very little implementation of those programs. Who, who uh, succeeds uh, President Johnson? It was uh, Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon runs in 1968 as a backlash to the poverty programs, as a backlash to the civil rights movement. He runs on the platform of law and order. He runs on the as a backlash to the rebellions taking place across the country. OK, and then in June 17th, 1971, what does Richard Nixon do? He declares his war on drugs. June 17th, 1971, the war on drugs didn't start with the 1994 crime bill. I don't know where the hell people got that from. It starts with Richard Nixon, June 17th, 1971, who ran on the platform of law and order, who ran on the platform of stopping the spending uh, billions of dollars on uh, anti-poverty programs. Uh, he, he, he ran on the platform of cracking down on the rebellions and the lawlessness in the country. Okay. Sound a lot like Donald Trump. That's the platform Richard Nixon ran on. And that's what he delivered. Okay. Now, um, 
Okay, and although President Biden indicated his support for a reparations commission, any sudden action is unlikely. The federal reluctance isn't entirely lamentable. Although local policymaking is often undervalued, decisions made closer to home can have larger impacts on Americans' everyday life than decisions made in Washington, D.C. Because when you have uh, the, the municipal uh, reparations task force, the municipal task force dealing with repairing the damage and social justice initiatives, things like this, right? It allows for uh, people at the local level to be involved more. It allows for them to uh, give their personal experiences. Okay. It's, it's, it's much different than things that take place at the federal level. Uh, second reason why municipal reparations is important is because municipalities municipalities provide the opportunity for community-centered reparations that other levels of government do not. A local approach a local approach allows for powerful, close to home storytelling, enabling greater understanding of connections between past and present. In turn, this animates the development of thoughtful, conducive reparations. Additionally, municipalities can solicit input more easily from community members and encourage their involvement. Okay, solicit input from community members and encourage their involvement. Now, a municipality or a local city, uh, a municipality-based approach also allows for accessibility and proximity between government and beneficiaries once the policy is in place. Such a plan can more effectively empower the community and enable rebuilding relationships with perpetrators of the injustice, if you want to. Uh, build a relationship with the perpetrators of the injustice. So for more information on this, this this, uh, this information comes from uh, University of Michigan's law school, Municipal Reparations, Considerations and Constitutionality, comes on pages 350 to 351 by Brooke Simone at U University of Michigan's, Michigan's law school. All right, now, if we look at briefly some history regarding Michigan and slavery because Michigan does not have a deep history of slavery and you know I, I talk to people who talk about 400 years and millions of slaves and things like that and I'm like well, where did that happen in Michigan where did that happen in Detroit different things happen like every state doesn't have the same history. Some things are similar, but uh, Michigan is not Mississippi. So historian and author Tia Mills, or Miles, I should say, Tia Miles, M-I-L-E-S, who's a professor in the Department of Afro-American and African Studies in the 2011 recipient of the MacArthur Foundation's Genius Grant, is a shining light on is shining a light on Detroit's dark secret in her new book, The Dawn of Detroit: A Chronicle of Slavery and Freedom in the City of the Straits, S T R A I T S. So this came out. Uh, this book came out in 2017. She says slavery in Detroit grew out of the bustling fur trade. Grew out of the bustling fur trade. Well, I should say the article says this. Slavery in Detroit grew out of the bustling fur trade when the settlement was still under French control, Tia Mill said uh, in the article. Now, Detroit was a French settlement called Detroit, founded in 1701. As trade ramped up along the busy river port, the power brokers needed a labor force to grow and process food, handle fur, operate boats maintain domestic spaces, and more. 
At this time, Native American slaves local to the region outnumbered their African American counterparts in Detroit. So, yes, Native Americans were enslaved also. Now, it wasn't when we look at the Americas, it was to a lesser extent than African Americans, generally speaking. But yes, Native Americans were enslaved. All, oftentimes, this doesn't get talked about. And when you look at, um, I, I talked about uh, Bacon's Rebellion, 1675, 1676. You've heard me talk about Bacon's Rebellion. And when we look at, um, there was a presentation I did for, who was that? Was that the Equal Justice Alliance or? Uh, it was one of them. I can't remember was when I spoke at um, Thurgood Marshall um, Law School, uh, Howard University, or the Equal Justice Alliance. Let me see. Which one was that? I talked about... Um, Bacon's Rebellion, 1675, 1676 in the county of Virginia. And, oh, I know what it was. It was, I was on uh, the Midwest Decarbonization uh, Environmental, their, their, their conference that they had, their Midwest conference that they had. And I was on a panel with Native Americans. We were talking about um, reparations for African Americans. And uh, we were talking about uh, the effort of Native Americans to get their land returned to them. Yeah, Midwest, Midwest Building Decarbonization Coalition, second annual virtual equity summit. That was in 2022. That's when I that's when I did that. Okay, so I'm looking through all these presentations I've done. I talked about uh, Bacon's Rebellion and King Philip's War of um, King Philip's War 1676 in the county of Virginia. And in this information, I'm looking at this uh, slide now. I'm looking at the presentation now. They talk about yeah Native Americans being enslaved also. Let's look at this quickly here to put this in historical context. So um, leading up to this inter leading up to this presentation, because this was in uh, November 2022, I interviewed uh, Marnice Chris Jackson on the uh, Marnice Jackson on the uh, my show, the African History Network show, talking about how climate change harms African Americans. Okay, and this was like to promote the uh, conference and me speaking at the conference. All right, Native American slavery is a piece of the history of slavery that has been glossed over, said Lynn Ford D. Fisher, L-I-N-F-O-R-D, Associate Professor of History at Brown University. Between 1492 and 1880, between 2 million and 5.5 million Native Americans were enslaved in the Americas, in the Americas, not here in the United States, but in the Americas, in addition to at least 12.5 million uh, African slaves. While natives had been forced into slavery and servitude as early as 1636, it was not until King Philip's War that natives were enslaved in large numbers, Associate Professor Lynn Ford Fisher wrote in the study. The 1675 to 1676 war pitted Native American leader King Philip, also known as Metacom, not to be confused with Megatron. Okay, that's the Transformers. 
uh, the Autobots versus the Decepticons, Metacom and his allies against the English colonial settlers. During the war, King Philip's War, New England colonies routinely shipped Native Americans as slaves to Barbados, Bermuda, Jamaica, the Azores, Spain, and Tangier in North Africa, Professor Linford, Linford Fisher said. While Africans who were enslaved did not know where they would be taken, Native Americans understood that they could be sent to Caribbean plantations and face extremely harsh treatment far from their homes and communities, according to the study. Fear of this fate spurred some Native Americans to pledge to fight to the death, while others surrendered, hoping to avoid being sent overseas, the study found. Professor, Lin, Professor Linford Fisher's study uh, entitled, Why Shall We Have Peace to Be Made Slaves, Indian Surrenderers During and After King Philip's War, appears in the journal Ethnohistory, a volume devoted to scholarship on indigenous slavery in the New World. Native American enslavement was documented in colonial correspondence, shipping records, court cases, town records, colonial government orders, and petitions from colonists to the British government. Uh, check out this piece. This is from uh, brown.edu, Brown uh, University. Brown.edu, February 15th, 2017. It's called Colonial Enslavement of Native Americans Included Those Who Surrendered To. And then Bacon's Rebellion was taking place in the Virginia County, 1675, 1676, around the same time that King Philip's War was taking place. All right, now, okay, so how do you all like this type of information? Give us a thumbs up, give us a heart, give us a like on this broadcast. Hope you're learning a lot. Um, you can register for the 10 week online history course that I teach what we deal with thousands of years of history and what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. I teach the class uh, normally on Saturdays, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Visit our website, africanhistorynetwork.com, africanhistorynetwork.com, register for the class. Uh, ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa. Kemet's one of the original names for Egypt. Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. We have the... Um, Lesson plans here for all 10 classes, actually 11, because we did an intro. We did the first class, we did an intro. So we have 11 weeks planned. You could download the lesson plan here. It lays out the content of each class. Uh, reg click right here to register. As soon as you register, you can start watching uh, the previous classes and join us uh, for the next classes, March 16th, March 23rd, April 30th, and April 6th. Have all the sessions are archived and recorded. You can go back and watch it anytime. You can also support the African History Network dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. This is our 14th year anniversary of me broadcasting the African History Network show. It started March 10th, 2010. A lot of people didn't think I'd still be around this long. Started March 10th, 2010 on the Harambe Radio Network. And I've done nasty syndicated radio on the Empowerment Radio Network. I've done uh, terrestrial radio here on 19 a.m. Superstation WFDF. I was on that radio station seven years. Did blog talk radio even before I went to the Parliament Radio Network. We were doing blog talk radio Thursdays, 8 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for a number of years. So I'm a 14 year radio veteran. Done local radio, nasty syndicated radio, internet radio. Pretty much done it all. All right, let's continue. Uh, let's go back to this here. Let's go back to the PowerPoint presentation. Okay, so when we look at the history of slavery in Michigan, um, slavery in Detroit grew out of the bustling fur trade 
And we see that uh, Detroit was founded by the French in uh, 1701. Also, we see that uh, in Detroit, there were Native American slaves as well. Uh, and at this time, Native American slaves local to the region outnumbered their African-American counterparts in Detroit. Now, the early censuses posted by uh, Professor Tia Mills, Miles, Tia Miles, and her students reveal the number of slaves steadily increased through the years. Records from 1773, 1773, um, which is two years before the American Revolutionary War started in 1775. Records from 1773 show there were 73 slaves in Detroit. Okay, not 7,000, not 70,000, 73. By 1782, the number had more than doubled to 170. Okay, not 170,000, 170. Even after the Northwest Ordinance took effect in 1787, clearly prohibiting slavery, and the Northwest Ordinance stated, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude shall exist in the territory, slaveholders found loopholes in the language and continued as though nothing had changed. But still, you had very low levels of slavery in the Michigan Territory. Now, the language from the 13th Amendment that people think re-enslaved African-Americans, that language comes from the Northwest Ordinance of 1787. Okay? In, in, in the, the whole... The, the, it did not re-enslave African-Americans. It, people don't understand this history that took place. Um, let's look at the Northwest Ordinance here. So we'll, we have, we'll look at two sources, Senate.gov, which is the uh, official website of the U.S. Senate, and then also Britannica.com. I have an excerpt from the information from Britannica here in the presentation. Uh, so we'll come to that in just a second. Now, refuting some long-held stereotypes about the early American North and South, Professor Tia Miles paints a picture of Detroit from about 1760 to 1815 when Native Americans and African Americans were considered property, okay, were slaves. In 1795, the Jay Treaty between the U.S. and Great Britain averted, averted war with England but it did little to change the status of Detroit's slaves. The treaty did ban the future purchase of slaves, but did not, but, but did nothing to free the nearly 300 people in bondage. So it's 1775. You got 300,000 slaves, not 300, not 300,000. You have 300 slaves, I should say. 300 slaves, not 300,000, not 30,000, not 3,000. 300. Um, read this article, Detroit's Dark Secret Slavery. This is from Michigan Today. U, uh, U Mich, M I C H. E D U. This is at University of Michigan. Uh, this is from February 19th, 2018. Now, Michigan becomes a state in the Union in 1837. And when it become a state in the Union in 1837 in the Michigan State Constitution, they abolished slavery. Now, in 1830, how many slaves did Michigan have in 1830? The 1830 U.S. Census showed 32 slaves in the Michigan Territory. 32, not 320,000, but 32. But these numbers dwindled quickly. Michiganders became more critical of slavery and many began calling for its abolition. The act of officially ending something. So, you know, you had abolitionists here in Michigan. As the Civil War neared, Civil War begins April 12, 1861. As the Civil War neared, 
Some worked in the Underground Railroad to help people escape from slavery. Now, also, don't confuse. Don't confuse slaves being in Michigan, owned by people who are in Michigan. Don't confuse that with slaves coming from the south, going up north on the Underground Railroad, going into hiding in Second Baptist Church, going across the river to Canada. But still, Michigan have very low, low numbers. Um, read Michigan in the American Civil War. This is at legislature.mi.gov. This is from the Michigan State Legislature. Michigan in the American Civil War. This is at legislature.mi.michigan.gov. Okay. And Michigan becomes a state in the Union in um, 1837. Now, also, let me pull this up quickly here. Um, I did not get a chance to get to this. I think I have it here. What is that? One of the, one of them I looked at. Uh, I think it's. Let's see. Is it this one? Let's close this other presentation now. Michigan, the American Civil War. Let me let me go to this right quick. Hold on. Michigan in the American Civil War. Let's see where we find this. And the reason why I wanted to pull this up is they talk about the origin of, is it in here? Origin of the word Michigan. Well, anyway, where is that where I saw that? The word uh, Michigan is an Ojibwa word. Um, and the Ojibwa is what we've been taught to call uh, Chippewa. Let me see, is it here? We'll have to find it later. It, it was in one of the one of the articles that I re read on this. I don't remember where it is now. I thought it was in the one um, with Tia Tia Miles, but maybe not. Oh, well, I'll have to find it later. Okay, let's continue. According to the terms of the Treaty of Paris in 1783, which ended the American uh, War of Independence, so the American Revolutionary War, which is 1775 to 1783, the western boundary of the United States was the Mississippi River. However, the British, wishing to exploit the fur, the fur rich Great Lakes region, refused to evacuate the country. 
after lengthy negotiations between American and British commissioners, Jay's treaty was ratified in 1794. One article called for the British to evacuate the region and a lesser known article directly affected the institution in the Great Lakes region. Quote, all settlers and traders shall, T-R-A-D-E-R-S, -T -E traders, shall continue to enjoy unmolested all their property of every kind. It shall be free to them to sell their houses, lands, or effects, or to retain the property there at their own discretion, end quote. Now, although this treaty seemed to violate the Northwest Ordinance of 1787, which prohibited slavery northwest of the Ohio River, the original settlers in the region were allowed to retain their slaves since, their, since they were considered private property. Michigan's territorial judge, Augustus B. Woodward, who Woodward Avenue is named after, Augustus B. Woodward in Detroit, mandated that no new slaves could be introduced into the territory. So he was a territorial judge here in Detroit. He mandated that no new slaves could be introduced into the territory, and gradually those who remained would either be emancipated or die, so that by 1837, when the new constitution, the state constitution of Michigan was created, there were only three slaves residing in the state of Michigan, not 300,000, not 30,000, not 3,000, but one, two, three. Officially titled an ordinance for the government of the territory of the United States northwest of the River Ohio. The Northwest Ordinance of 1787 was adopted on July 13, 1787 by the Confederation Congress. The, the Continental Congress, 1787, the one house legislature operating under the Articles of Confederation. Now, what does the North, what, what exactly was the Northwest Ordinance? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. The Northwest Ordinance of 1787 was the most important of the three acts, and it laid the basis for the government of the Northwest Territory and for the admission of its uh, constituent parts as states in the Union. So it, it, it applied to the Michigan Territory, Ohio Territory, Illinois, Indiana, Wisconsin, and part of, if I remember correctly, part of Massachusetts that was known as the Northwest Territory. Under this ordinance, each district was to be governed by a governor and judges appointed by Congress until it attained a population of 5,000 adults, uh, 5,000 adult free males, um, at which time it would become a territory and could form its own representative uh, legislature. The Northwest Territory must eventually comprise a minimum of three and a maximum of five states. And an individual territory could be admitted to statehood in the Union after having attained a population of 60,000. Under the ordinance, slavery was forever outlawed from the lands of the Northwest Territory. Freedom of, the re uh, freedom of religion and other civil liberties were guaranteed, the resident Indians were promised decent treatment and education was provided. So this is why, this is one of the main reasons why the history of Michigan regarding slavery is different than the South. Because the Northwest Ordinance pretty much outlawed slavery. Now it was, they, they outlawed uh, bringing slaves into the Northwest Territory you could uh, you could still for a period of time you could still own them, but it it prohibited bringing new slaves into the territory. So now the other thing is 
the climate in the south is more conducive to growing crops and the uh the southern states were more dependent upon slave labor to produce the crops to plant the crops things like this whereas the economy in michigan wasn't largely based on slave labor so so every state does not have the same history okay so you can't just talk about michigan and slavery 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 that no michigan's history is different uh for more information on the northwest ordinance re uh read the uh piece from britannica.com britannica.com uh on the northwest ordinance okay so that's one source for it now also you can check out um the let's see archives.gov u.s national archives uh a bill of rights protecting the northwest ordinance they talk about a, a bill of rights protecting religious freedom the right to a writ of habeas corpus the benefit of um the benefit of trial by jury and other individual rights in addition to in addition the ordinance encouraged education and forbade slavery okay so this is that archives.gov the u.s national archives and this is on um the northwest ordinance also now i want to take a quick look here at um, a couple of sources here so just give me a second let me pull these up because i have them up here in firefox so i think i have it at senate now this is national archives National Archives, and then we have it also, oh, history.house.gov. We'll look at that as well. Okay, so this is, let's pull this up, U.S. National Archives, Milestone Documents. Okay, right here, Northwest Ordinance 1787. They have a uh they show the original document ordinance okay right here ordinance for the government of the territory of the united states northwest of the river ohio and then it goes through and explains what it is okay so you can read that in addition the ordinance encouraged education and forbade slavery all right let me post the link here now i want to look at history.house.gov for the northwest ordinance because if i remember correctly they gave a better uh description of it yeah they gave a better description now what is house.gov House.gov is the official website of the U.S. House of Representatives. What is history.house.gov? Okay. History.house.gov is the history section of the U.S. House of Representatives official website. So I go there and do research also. Just like there's a history section at the at Senate.gov. Senate.gov is the official website of the U.S. Senate. So I go there and do research also. Historical highlights, the Northwest Ordinance of 1787, July 13, 1787. Okay, and then uh, it's a picture of Thomas Jefferson. As a member of the Confederation Congress, Thomas Jefferson of Virginia authored the 1784 Northwest Ordinance. In 1787, Thomas Jefferson served as a diplomat to the King of France. Okay, so long story short, Zoom in on some of this here. On this date, the Confederation Congress approved an ordinance for the government of the territory of the United States, northwest of the 
River, Ohio, by a vote of 17 to 1, better known as the Northwest Ordinance. It provided a path towards statehood for the territories northwest of the Ohio, northwest of the Ohio River, encompassing the area that would become the future states of Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, Ohio, Wisconsin, and part of Minnesota. Part of Minnesota. That's what it is. Part of Minnesota. So Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, Ohio, Wisconsin, part of Minnesota. Drafted by Massachusetts uh, delegates Rufus King and Nathan Dane, the 1787 ordinance sought to revise Thomas Jefferson's 1784 ordinance by designating the territories as one district which fell under Congress's jurisdiction. Okay. All right. So read the rest of this here. And let me see something. Okay. So read the rest of this here. So this is one of the main reasons why the history of Michigan dealing with slavery is totally different than the South. So let's look, at, let's compare Michigan to Mississippi. How many African slaves were in Mississippi? 1865, or let's say 1860, 1860. Slavery grew rapidly in Mississippi during the decades before the U.S. Civil War. Civil War is 1861 to 1865. By 1860, Mississippi's enslaved population was well over 430,000 African slaves. By 1860, Mississippi's population was well over 430,000, while there were only 350,000 white people in the state of Mississippi. Because what happened was, when you have the 1793, you have the cotton gin invented by Eli Whitney, and then you have copies of the cotton gin, and then you have um, the Louisiana Purchase, of 1803, which doubled the territory of the United States. So we get into this in the um, the second class that I teach, Black Resistance Movements from the Haitian Revolution, U.S. Civil War, Civil Rights Movement, and Black Power Movement. We get into uh, talking about the uh, Louisiana Purchase, because the, the class starts in 1800, dealing with the Haitian Revolution, which begins in 1791. And uh, we talk about the Louisiana Purchase of 1803. And those two events are connected because uh, France is going almost bankrupt, fighting against the Haitians in Haiti or Haiti or the French colony of St. Dominique. So France sells all the land they have here in the U.S., 828,000 square miles of land. They sell that to the U.S. for about $15 million. Uh, let me see here. Where the hell is that presentation? I think it's one of these here. We have so many presentations. Uh... Hold on, I want to pull up this information dealing with the Louisiana Purchase. So the Louisiana Purchase, now they try to keep a balance between slave states and free holdings, uh, uh, free states and slave holding states, right? But in the states that did uh, adopt slavery, what it did was it increased the need for slave labor, the, 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 the Louisiana Purchase. It increased the need for slave labor. Uh, 
let's look at this here. It should be this one right here. Okay, Louisiana Purchase right here. Let's go to this slide. So Louisiana Purchase of 1803 brought into the United States about 828,000 square miles of territory from France, thereby doubling the size of the Young Republic. What was known at the time as the Louisiana Territory stretched from the Mississippi River in the east to the Rocky Mountains in the west and from the Gulf of Mexico in the south to the Canadian border in the north. Part or all of 15 states were eventually created from the land deal, which is considered one of the most important achievements of Thomas Jefferson's presidency. Now, this was land basically France stole from Native Americans and African people that were, that were here. Because if you read Dr. David M. Hotep's book, The First Americans Were Africans, documented evidence, you know that African people were in this land we call the United States of America even before Native Americans came into existence. But this land here in the darker green, this is made up the territory that the U.S. got from France in the Louisiana Purchase of 1803. Okay, now let's go back to Mississippi and slavery in Mississippi. Let's go back to this slide here. Okay, here we go. So in 1860, Mississippi has 430,000 enslaved Africans. Yet most white people were not slaveholders, and even those who were, other than plantation owners, enslaved fewer than 10, than 10 people. The state's economy was primarily based on the production of cotton, which depended heavily on enslaved people to provide the necessary labor. So um, the... Uh, the South is produced somewhere around 1830. The South is producing about 50% of the world's cotton supply. And uh, Mississippi, but going, if we go to say 1860, Mississippi is one of the top cotton producers in the country, providing a large portion of the world's population of cotton. There was an article, I want to see if I can put my hands on this one. There was an article from history.com that I was looking at in preparation for this presentation that I did a week ago that talks about this. Uh, I think this is it here. Yeah, this one right here from history.com. This deals with slavery in America. Let's go to this quickly. Okay, slavery in America, history.com is official website of the History Channel. And they talk about out, um, New Hershey's Milk Wishes, creamy milk. There's a part in here dealing with um, cotton and okay, talk about the cotton gin. Talk about the cotton gin and okay, 1793. A young a young Yankee school teacher named Eli Whitley invented Eli Whitney invented the cotton gin a simple mechanized device that efficiently removed the seeds. His device was widely copied, and within a few years, within a few years, 
South transitioned from large, from the large scale production of tobacco to that of cotton, a switch that reinforced the region's dependence on enslaved labor. The, co the cotton gin basically changed all this stuff. Okay, the cotton gin. Then in 1803, the Louisiana Purchase. Slavery itself was never widespread in the North, though many of the region's businessmen grew rich on the slave trade and investments in plantations. That is true, especially in New York, because New York made money from slavery even after um, slavery was abolished in New York in 1817. Okay. Uh, the stock market and um, banks in New York investing in uh, southern plantations, etc. Between 1774 and 1804, most of the northern states abolished slavery or started the process to abolish slavery. But the institution of slavery remained remained vital to the south. Remained vital to the south. Okay, though the U.S. Congress outlawed the African slave trade in 1808. That's based upon Article 1, Section 9, Clause 1 of the U.S. Constitution of uh, 1787 that goes into effect January 1st, 1808, that abolished the international transatlantic slave trade. The domestic slave trade flourished, and the enslaved population in the United States nearly tripled over the next 50 years because it was still legal to own slaves and sell them, trade them in the U.S., the international transatlantic slave trade being abolished in 1808 abolished bringing Africans into the country to enslave them. But Europeans kept breaking those laws and kept doing them, kept doing that. By 1860, it had reached nearly 4 million with more than half living in the cotton producing states of the South. Okay. Now there was, uh, uh, there was, To understand what the Missouri Compromise is and why it's so significant right. in American history. Okay, I can't find uh, I can't find what I was looking for there. But anyway, let's continue. Okay, now the state's economy. A state of Mississippi's economy was primarily based on the production of cotton, which depended heavily on enslaved people to provide the necessary labor. Slavery was as much a social structure, however, as it was an economic system. Most white people believed in the inferiority of those who were enslaved and considered them to be no more than property. Now, let's look at Texas, for instance, right? Texas. June 1865, when Major General Gordon Granger goes into Galveston, Texas, June 19th, 1865. How many enslaved Africans were in Texas? Tex in Texas, slavery had continued as the state experienced, as the state experienced no large scale fighting or significant presence of Union troops. So, Texas was a safe haven for slaveholders, okay? And um, slave owners from surrounding states, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, things like this, would take their enslaved Africans and they, they would flee into Texas. Many enslavers from outside the Lone Star State had moved there as they viewed it as a safe haven for slavery. After the war came to an end for all practical purposes, well, generally April 1865, even, even though the Civil War goes on for about another 16 months until August of 1866, when uh, President uh, Andrew Johnson uh, officially announces the end of the Civil War. And the reason why it continued at a much lesser to a much lesser extent is because um, April 9th, 1865, when General Robert E. Lee surrenders to General Ulysses S. Grant at Appomattox Courthouse in Virginia, General Robert E. Lee's Confederate Army was the largest Confederate Army, but it was not the only Confederate Army. 
You had General Joseph E. Johnston's Army of Tennessee. You had Nathan Bedford Forrest's uh, uh, Confederate Army, things like this. So even though there were, uh, and there's a good article that deals with this um, from history.com that deals with the Civil War. Why the Civil War um, actually ended 16 months after Lee surrendered? OK, so check out this article, because in the second class that I teach, we, we deal with this history. This is important to understand, uh, just like it's important to understand history leading up to the transatlantic slave trade. It's extremely important to understand the history leading up to the Civil War starting. Why the Civil War actually ended 16 months after Lee surrendered. For one, things were a little confusing in Texas. OK, and. Um, Appomattox was undoubtedly a decisive victory. Uh, then they talk about uh, 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 General William Tecumseh Sherman and General Joseph E. Johnston. OK, uh, they talk about Johnston's army of Tennessee. Yeah, for one thing, Lee surrendered only his army of northern Virginia to Ulysses S. Grant. And other conf Confederate forces still remained active, starting with General Joseph E. Johnston's Army of Tennessee, the second largest Confederate army after General Robert E. Lee's. Then you had uh, that traitor who became the first uh, the first Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan, uh, Nathan Bedford Forrest. You had that. You had that demon. Several days later, Nathan Bedford Forrest gave up his cavalry corps at uh, Gainesville, Alabama, telling his men that we are beaten uh, is a self-evident fact and any further resistance on our part would justify, uh, uh, would justly be regarded as the very height of folly and rashness. And, and Nathan Bedford forced uh, the, the Tennessee State Legislature at the Tennessee State House, they had the, they had the bust of this traitor in the Tennessee state legislature up until about uh, 2021, it was finally removed. We talked about it on uh, um, Roland Martin Unfiltered and on the African History Network show. This right here, this article, this is from fox17.com. 2021, they finally removed the bus from this traitor. And if, you, if you've been paying attention to what's going on with the Tennessee state legislature and the racism in Tennessee and the attacks on the, uh, the two young brothers, the two Justins in the uh, state legislature there in Tennessee. All you have to do is understand Tennessee's love of Nathan Bedford Forrest, who this demon right here led the Fort Pillow massacre where about 200 um, African-American Union soldiers were executed. Many of them shot at point-blank range. That was led by Nathan Bedford Forrest. Uh, this is from Fox 17 WZTV Nashville. Bust of KKK leader Nathan Bedford Forrest removed from Tennessee State Capitol. July 23rd, 2021. They got the video of them, of them removing this traitor. It says, for the first time since the 1970s, the Tennessee Capitol is no longer home to a bust of early Ku Klux Klan leader and Confederate General Nathan Bedford Forrest. Okay, so read read this here. Instead of the Fort Pillow massacre during the uh, the Civil War. Here's a good article from um, the Washington Post that I use in my classes dealing with the Fort Pillow Massacre. This one right here. The Civil War Massacre that left nearly 200 black soldiers murdered. This is by Denine L. Brown. She writes some really good historical articles for the Washington Post. I've read a number of her articles. October 28th, 2018. Here's a picture of that traitor, once again, Nathan Bedford Forrest. Uh, 
Um, okay, so they talk about the four hour tab to get to get into this, but the 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 Confederates, including sharpshooters, unleashed a storm of bullets on the fort, killing uh, uh, Booth and let me see who is this? Uh, yeah, Major uh, Lionel F. F. Booth. As many as 300 Union soldiers, including 200 black soldiers, were killed. Many were shot point blank in the head. Okay, to read this uh, article here. The Civil War massacre that nearly that left nearly 200 black soldiers murdered. Okay, now, uh, okay, wrong presentation. Let's go to uh, this one. I think that's the right one. Hold on. Okay, I skipped it here too far. Let's see. Let's go back right here. Okay, Northwest Ordinance in Texas. All right, so. Texas was a safe haven for slave on, slave owners. War came to a close in the spring of 1865. General Gordon Granger's arrival in Galveston, Texas, in uh, June. Okay, and that's why we comm commemorate June 19, 1865, when he delivered General Order Number Three there in Galveston. Um, there were 250,000 enslaved African people in Texas. 250,000 enslaved people in Texas. The, the history of Michigan is totally different than, than the history of Texas and Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, Tennessee, Florida. And when we, when we studied Juneteenth, it was not the last day of slavery. Emancipation Proclamation did not free the slaves. And if you actually go to archives.gov and read the Emancipation Proclamation, it exempted the border states like Maryland, Missouri, Kentucky, and Delaware. They were allowed to keep their slaves. So Maryland did not abolish slavery until November 1st, 1864. There's a, there's a good article called from the Washington Post called The Not Quite Free State. Uh, let me see what's it called. The Not Quite Free State. Maryland dragged its feet on emancipation during the Civil War. Tennessee didn't abolish slavery till February 22nd, 1865. That's two years after the Emancipation Proclamation, January 1st, 1863. Kentucky and Delaware did not abolish slavery till December 18th, 1865, when the 13th Amendment was adopted. Because it's actually going to be the 13th Amendment, which is uh, ratified December 6th, 1865, and adopted December 18th, 1865. That's what legally ends chattel slavery legally frees the slaves but but read this article here then with maryland because in maryland they put ending slavery on the ballot and people voted on it and it almost did not pass the vote was thirty thousand one hundred and seventy four in favor of freeing the slaves twenty nine thousand seven hundred seventy nine against freeing the slaves it was only after the absentee ballots of soldiers fighting in the north were counted that that put the initiative over the top and ended slavery so november 1st 1864 maryland slaves were declared free no wonder republicans don't like mail-in ballots and absentee ballots i'm just kidding but <laughs> all right so re so read this article here dealing with when slavery ended in, in Maryland. All right, now, uh, also with Major General Gordon Granger, he goes into Texas with about 2,000 uh, Union troops, most of them African-American men. 
They go all throughout Texas for almost a year, physically bringing Texas back into the union. So June 19th was the date that was agreed to commemorate what took place there in Texas. But that wasn't the, the all, all the slaves in Texas did not get their freedom on June 19th. They, they went through Texas for almost a year enforcing general order number three and physically bringing Texas back into the union. Now, although emancipation didn't happen overnight for everyone, in some cases, and slavers withheld the information until after harvest season, celebrations broke out among newly freed black people. If you read slave narratives about this, you, you'll see it was jubilation. And Juneteenth was born. That December, slavery in America was formally abolished with the adoption of the 13th Amendment, December 18th, 1865. I'll read this article from history.com. What is Juneteenth? Juneteenth and slavery in Texas. Now, as I talked about before, and we're going to wrap this up in a few minutes here, because I've gone longer than I thought I was going to go, or longer than I wanted to. Um, before we can start talking about the, to, to actually repair the damage of a legacy of slavery and racism, Jim Crow segregation, et cetera, you have to properly assess the damage that was done. You have to properly assess the damage that was done. Okay. Before you can make recommendations for reparations, before you can start talking about cutting checks, all this other stuff. All right. And the reason why is, first of all, if we all got a million dollars a day, you know damn well white people will have it all back by this time next week. Nobody really wants to be honest. If we all got a million dollars a day, you know white people will have it all back by this time next week. And the laws and policies put in place that maldistributed wealth pound resources, like I like I laid out in the executive order, I mean in, in the executive summary from the California Reparations Task Force. Those laws and policies will still be in place inflicting harm once you spend the money. This is why we have to have a comprehensive repairing of the damage. But especially at the local level, you have to have what's known as a harm report done. A harm report has to be done to understand uh, what happened, how it happened, the harm that was inflicted to understand what to repair. All right, let's continue. And be sure to register for the, uh, those just joining us, be sure to register for the online history classes that I teach on Saturdays. Um, Ancient Kemet, one of the original names for Egypt, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. We have the information at our website, africanhistorynetwork.com. That's africanhistorynetwork.com. So we do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. Uh, you can go back and watch it anytime, even after the uh, course is over with. You can go back and watch the entire class. Our next classes will be uh, March 6th, Saturday, March 16th, March 23rd, March 30th, April 6th. And we have uh, some classes after April 6th also. So scroll down, just click on register here. And we have our full class lesson plans uh, here that you can download as well for all 10 classes plus uh, the introduction that I did. We have the class lesson plans here all. All right, let's continue. All right, so how you like this type of information? Give us a thumbs up, give us a heart, give a like on this broadcast. This is our 14th year anniversary of me broadcasting the African History Network show, which started March 10th, 2024 as well so you can uh, also support the african history network dollar sign the ahn show through cash app dollar sign the ahn show through cash app also through paypal paypal.me forward slash the ahn show and we have the information at our website all right let's go back to the uh powerpoint presentation here
Okay, so assessing the damage. Uh, before you can make recommendations for reparations, you first have to properly assess the damage that was done. This is what the California Reparations Task Force is doing with the 1,000 page final study that was released June 29, 2023. There's a good article from CNN.com. Uh, California Reparations Task Force releases final set of recommendations, came out June 29, 2023. A task force examining reparations for black residents in California released its final report Thursday, June 29, 2023, with more than 115 policy recommendations for how the state should compensate those harmed by slavery and historical atrocities. Recommendations in the landmark report uh, comprised of more than 1,000 pages and included recommendations for reforms linked to health care, housing, education, and criminal justice, among other areas. The task force hired a panel of experts, including economists, to calculate what African Americans have endured, what what uh, California's African Americans have endured. Through their formula, they determined that an eligible person could be owed up to an estimated one point two million dollars. Could be owed up to an estimated one point two million dollars. The formula includes dollars lost because of race-based health disparities, mass incarceration, housing discrimination, unjust land seizure, and other harms that that have had more impacts, had they have had major impacts on black Californians. In the case of monetary reparations, only those individuals who can demonstrate that they are the descendant of either an enslaved African American in the US or a free African-American living in the U.S. prior to 1900 should be eligible, the report says. Now, that when we look at the executive summary, um, that is on page 41 of the uh, executive summary. Let me pull this up here. Let's go back to this. Now, the reason why they had this structured that way is because race-based policies are illegal in the state of California. Race-based policies are also illegal at the federal level, but they're illegal in the state of California. And on page 41 here in the executive summary, it lays this out. Let me see, page 41. I want to hold, I want to go to this and show this to you. Okay, let's see. It's right in here. Um, it's forty-two. Let's go to forty-one. Okay, yeah, 1900 right here. Okay, so this is page 41 of the executive summary. The task force voted to recommend that only those individuals who are able to demonstrate that they are the descendant of either an enslaved African-American in the United States or a free African-American living in the United States prior to 1900 be eligible for monetary reparations, be eligible for monetary reparations. Uh, the task force also determined that the state of California potentially through the recommended new California uh, American Freedmen's Affairs Agency should take responsibility for assisting and uh, assisting any requester in establishing whether they qualify by funding or otherwise hand handling the tracing and confirmation of this lineage through whatever means necessary. 
Okay, so they had to do it by lineage because race-based policies are illegal in the state of California, meaning that it's illegal to have policies for only one race of people. Now, federal law is similar to that as well. And that is Title VI of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, Section 601, Non-Discrimination in Federally Assisted Programs. This is why race-based policies are illegal at the federal level. This is why people thinking that they're just going to get reparations, monetary reparations for all African Americans. And then they say, well, the Japanese got this and that, but they haven't really researched what the Japanese got. This is why none of that's going to happen. At the federal level, at best, they're going to do it by lineage, but that's not going to, some, some people are going to be left out. Title VI of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, non-discrimination and fairly assisted programs. What does it say? Section 601. No person in the United States shall, on the ground of race, color, or national origin, be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. This is at archives.gov, U.S. National Archives. This is why race-based policies, you got these people out here, we, we, we want race-specific policies. We only want policies for black people. Who the hell told you some stupid nonsense like that? Y'all listen to a bunch of idiots. That's illegal, okay? Anybody lying to you telling you that, I don't know what to tell you. You got a bunch of dumbasses on social media just putting stuff out here. They can't cite no sources, just make stuff up, okay? And then when they have a head-on collision with the truth, they don't know what to do. Now, you have people who say, well, the Japanese got this. Okay, well, let's, let's look at what the Japanese got. I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, anybody ever been to justice.gov? What's justice.gov? Um, U.S. Department of Justice website. Let's look at this. And I, and, I, and I put this on the screen when I did my presentation for the Detroit Reparations Task Force because a lot of people don't understand what happened. Now, this is from February 19th, 1999. Immediate release. 10-year program to compensate Japanese Americans in turn during World War II closes its doors. Okay? This is at Justice.gov, U.S. Department of Justice website. You can Google this, pull this up. Go to the website. What happened? After paying out more than $1.6 billion to more than 82,250 persons of Japanese ancestry who were interned during World War II, the Justice Department's Office of Redress Administration has officially closed its doors. It was payments of a well, one time payment of $20,000. It did not go to all Japanese Americans in the United States. It was very specific who it went to. The redress program, which was established by the Civil Liberties Act of 1988, acknowledges, apologizes, and makes restitution for the fundamental injustice of the, of the evacuation, relocation, and internment of Japanese Americans during World War II, okay? It did not go to subsequent generations. Let's look at what happened. Since the program's inception, uh, it, it provided $20,000 in redress to 82,219 eligible claimants, totaling more than $1.6 billion, okay? In order to have been eligible for restitution, an applicant had to have been alive on August 10th, 1988, they had to have been a U.S. citizen or permanent resident alien during the internment period. The internment period was from December 7th, 1941 to June 30th, 1946. Okay. So you're dealing with roughly about, uh, about four years. 
they had to be a person of Japanese ancestry or the spouse or parent of a person of Japanese ancestry and evacuated, relocated, interned, or otherwise deprived of liberty or property as a result of federal government action during the internment period and based solely on their Japanese ancestry. This, then, this did not apply to subsequent generations of Japanese Americans. This, this applied to those who were put into internment camps, those who were forced to be relocated, or if they were the spouse of, say, say you had a white woman married to a Japanese man, and then the family is put into an internment camp because they don't want to be separated. So the family's put into an internment camp, okay? But that wasn't for subsequent generations for people who weren't born during this period of time and weren't put into internment camps and didn't have to flee. It was very specific. It did not apply to all Japanese Americans. So read the, read the rest of this here, okay? I'm going to post the link. Then, you, uh, then there's another document that I want to cite very quickly because this goes into more detail of what happened. Now, this is from National Library of Medicine. National Library of Medicine. And this deals with the Japanese American wartime incarceration, examining the scope of racial trauma. So, the way the bill came about, uh, now Japanese Americans have been advocating for this leading up to 1988. And they had hearings. They brought in witnesses. Uh, let's look at this here. Okay. The Japanese American wartime uh, incarceration examining the scope of racial trauma, right? And if we look at, okay, so 10 weeks after the Japanese military attack on Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, then the, uh, the U.S. government authorized the removal of more than 110,000 Japanese American men, women, and children from their homes in western portions of the country um, to incarceration camps in desolate areas of the United States, okay? Uh, however, an extensive government review initiated in 1980 found no evidence of military necessity to support the removal decision and concluded that the incarceration was a grave injustice fueled by racism and war hysteria. The Japanese American wartime experience represents a powerful case of race based historical trauma. Uh, they go on to talk. OK, read the rest of that. Now, I want to get to this here. Seven fifty right here. Okay. The Japanese Americans' trauma remained largely unaddressed for decades. In 1980, however, Congress formed the Commission on Wartime Relocation and Internment of Civilians to assess the circumstances surrounding the incarceration. In addition to reviewing extensive documents and records, the Commission gathered testimonies from over 750 witnesses in 20 cities across the country. Many of those who testified were former incarcerees who for the first time since the war spoke of the suffering they endured. So they brought, they brought in witnesses. They had congressional hearings. They brought in witnesses. They interviewed witnesses to give firsthand accounts of what happened to them and, and the uh, long-term effects of being in those internment camps. The commission concluded that the incarceration was a grave, a grave injustice and recommended that Congress issue a public written apology along with a one-time payment of $20,000 to each surviving incarceree. More than 40 years after the war, the Civil Liberties Act of 1988 was signed into law and uh, it was signed into law by President Ronald Reagan and followed the commission's uh, the commission recommendations. Now, uh, as I stated, race-based policies are illegal at the federal level. That's Title VI of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Go to, go to archives.gov and read it. The other problem that you have 
is all of the last of the former slaves died in the 1950s. All of the last of the former slaves died in the 1950s. So you don't have witnesses to what actually in slavery who can testify. Now you do have um, slave narrative. You, you, you do have interviews that were done with former slaves in about the 1930s and 40s by the federal government, but you don't have live witnesses like you did, like you did with the Japanese. They they interviewed people who they interviewed 750 witnesses who were actually put into the internment camps or had to evacuate. They were there. Okay. That's why I said all things considered in, in the climate that we're in in this country need to take those 115 policy recommendations from the California Reparations Task Force, craft policies at the federal, state, and local level, especially federal and state, to get those bills passed. Take the term reparations off of anything you actually want to get passed, especially if white people have to vote for it. Because the other thing is, most of Americans, two thirds of Americans are against reparations. This right here, this comes from an article from the Associated Press, APnews.com. Japanese Americans won redress fight for black reparations. So it talks about how you have groups of Japanese Americans who are siding with African Americans for us to actually get reparations. But in the article, it says only 30% of US adults surveyed by Pew Research Center in 2021 supported reparations for slavery in some way for descendants of formerly enslaved people. 77% of whom were black Americans, support among Latinos and Asians was 39% and 33% respectively, 39% for Latinos, 33% for Asian Americans. And white Americans had the lowest rate of support for reparations at 18%, surprise, surprise, surprise. The committee's report, um, California Reparations Task Force, lays out 112 recommendations, uh, right around 115, that include programs around housing, education, and public health, among other, among many others. The California Legislative Black Caucus has hired a team of experts to whittle down the massive report to a digestible length, to a digestible length. That condensed report would be shared with the public in the California Assembly, which will have to vote on bills based on the recommendations. Uh, Representative Joan Sawyer uh, said the group plans to ultimately create and present 12 bills that will cover the report's recommendations. He said the uh, first five bills will be introduced at the start of 2024 and, quote, will span just about every category in the report, uh, whether it's racial terror, education, the criminal justice system, incarceration rates, home ownership, the wealth gap, et cetera. Uh, this is an article from uh, NBCnews.com. Reparations gained historic momentum in 2023 because of California's efforts. So what really needs to happen especially at the federal level, is to shift the focus from talking about slavery to focusing on present day structural inequities and deal with the laws and policies put in place and deal with the history that created those structural inequities and trace that back to slavery. Because the structural inequities are more prevalent, it's easier to see, okay? This greater documentation is, is more prevalent. Deal with the laws and policies put in place that created the structural inequities and, and continues to perpetuate them. Trace that back to a history of slavery, if, if it applies to slavery. Segregation, redlining, housing discrimination, etc. And then craft policies to address the present day structural inequities because they are the legacy of slavery in many cases. Show how, and you have to show how these policies. So remove reparations from the discussion. I, I would take the term, like I said, take the term reparations off of anything that you actually want to get past, especially white people have to vote for it. 
and focus on the policies that are designed to repair the damage. Show how these policies are beneficial for everyone, not just African-Americans, since most of the people who have to vote for these policies are not African-Americans. In some cases, most of the people that have to vote for them are white. Uh, okay, take a look at this. Uh, there was another article, California's Unprecedented Reparations Report Details 150 Years of Anti-Black Harm. There was an article from NBCNews.com, June 1st, 2022 on this. Now, the uh, California Reparations Task Force lays out 12 areas of harm, okay, 12 areas of harm. They admit there are more than 12, but they focus on these 12 and then craft policies around these 12 to repair the damage. One, they talk about enslavement. Two, racial terror. Three, political disenfranchisement. Four, housing discrimination. Five, separate and unequal education. Six, racism in environment and infrastructure. Seven, pathologizing the black family. Eight, control over creative, cultural, and intellectual life. That deals with um, having like our... our um, royalty stolen when it comes to uh music okay there was an article from uh rolling stone magazine dealing with this california reparations task force takes on the historic theft of black art and culture this piece right here this is from june 1st 2022 California Reparations Task Force takes on the historic theft of black art and culture. Now, th now, this came out when the interim report came out, which was almost 600 pages in uh, 2022, the interim report. Nearly 600 page interim, interim report is the most extensive government issue report on the African-American community since, the 19, since 1968 according to the task force chair since the Kerner commission report. Okay. This, this reparations task force report is the most extensive uh, report on African-Americans since the 1968 Kerner commission report. Okay. Uh, so in this article, I got to subscribe. I have, I have so many monthly subscriptions that I have to pay for, but this talks about theft of royalties. Uh, that's one of the things it deals with, and theft of black culture. Okay, number eight, control over creative, cultural, and intellectual life. Number nine, stolen labor and hindered opportunity. Number 10, an unjust legal system. Number 11, mental and physical harm and neglect. Number 12, the racial wealth gap and closing the racial wealth gap. So those are the 12 harms that they laid out. Now, when we look at briefly Detroit's history of racism against African-Americans, just to highlight a few things, uh, we see 1930, the housing crisis, uh, African-Americans in the city of Detroit were systematically um, shut out of the housing market due to structural racism. Redlining played an integral role in the housing crisis. Racial restrictive covenants, public housing, and 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 lastly, slum removal. Uh, uh, slum removal. Um, the racial restrictive covenants you had in the deeds of white homeowners is stated that they could only sell that house to another white family. They couldn't sell it to African Americans. So that locked us out of. Uh, the ability oftentimes to buy homes, even though some of us were able to, a lot more of us were locked out of being able to buy homes, use uh, uh, low interest loans from the Federal Housing Association, use low interest loans from the GI Bill that many of us earned the benefits from, from like serving in World War II, et cetera. Being able to acquire homes and then the homes accumulate in value, accumulate wealth, having that asset to pass down to future generations. OK, that is housing discrimination that, that, that deals with housing discrimination when it comes to home ownership. 
and that negatively impacts generational wealth. By 1940, 80% of Detroit's residences abided by uh, racial covenants and thereby restricted black housing to historically impoverished and dangerous areas based on race. Now, there's a report from the Brookings Institute that deals with the um, segregation tax. And it talks about the uh, devaluation of assets. It talks about how African-American homes are valued at, on average, $48,000 less than comparable white homes. Okay, so we look at this right here from the Brookings Institute. And this is an accumulated uh, loss of wealth of $156 billion. The devaluation of assets in black neighborhoods, the case for residential properties, Andre Perry, Jonathan Rothwell, and David Harshbarger uh, November 27, 2018. This is from the Brookings Institute. And they talk about, okay, home ownership. Okay, they talk about redlining. However, for many of its citizens, America deferred that dream for much of the 20th century. The devaluing of black lives led to segregation and racist federal housing policy through redlining that shut out chances for black people to purchase homes and build wealth, making it difficult to start and invest in businesses and afford college tuition. Still, home ownership remains a beacon of hope for all people to gain access to the middle class. Though home ownership rates vary considerably between whites and people of color, it typic it, it's typically the largest asset among all people who hold it. Okay, so then they talk about this right here. Um, this, what is the cost of racial bias? What is the cost of racial bias? This report seeks to understand how much money majority black communities are losing in the housing market stemming from racial bias, finding that Owner-occupied homes in black neighborhoods are, are undervalued by $48,000 per home on average, amounting to $156 billion in cumulative losses. So that drastically impacts the generational wealth and the, and the racial wealth gap. Okay, so read that. It's at the Brookings Institute. De the devaluation of assets in black neighborhoods. All right, and then let's see. Okay, so we have that. Uh, then with Detroit, then you have the 1943 race ride, 1943 race ride in June, 1943 during World War II. Uh, I-375 removed. Uh, uh, I-375 removal of Black Bottom. Black Bottom was a uh, African American neighborhood uh, here in, in Detroit, and that was part of the. U.S. Interstate Highway Acts in 1952 and 56, sanctioned police brutality, 1967 Detroit Rebellion, 1990 to 1995, take over Detroit public schools by uh, uh, by the state, state of Michigan, the Detroit bankruptcy, and over assessment of property taxes, over assessment of property taxes, and over assessment of property taxes is one of the ways that our homes and property has been historically taken away from us. There was an article uh, from the Washington Post by Andrew Van Dam, Andrew Van Dam. Black families pay significantly higher property taxes than white families, new analysis shows. 
black families pay significantly higher property taxes than white families new analysis shows unfair property assessments led to uh lead to widespread overtaxation of black americans homes so we know here in detroit there was an overtaxation over a number of years of 600 million dollars to african american homeowners many of them uh, to two homeowners in detroit many of them african american and a lot of those people ended up losing their homes because they couldn't pay the the property taxes uh state by state this article says state by state neighborhood by neighborhood black families pay 13 percent more in property taxes each year than a white family than a white family would in the same situation a massive new data analysis shows black owned homes are consistently assessed at higher values relative to their actual sale price than white homes according to a new working paper by economist uh troop howard of the uh, university of utah and carlos avanancio leon of indiana university african americans have long said they bear a disproportionate burden for taxes that support local police schools and parks but nationwide measures of this type of systemic racism are hard to come by to expose the structural and historical factors behind these discriminatory property tax assessments the economists analyzed more than a decade of tax assessment and sales data for 118 million homes throughout the country so this is not they're not in isolated incidences they analyzed more than 118 homes throughout the country in almost every state property tax assessments were higher in areas with more black and hispanic residents okay so read the rest of this article here black families pay significantly higher property taxes than white families new analysis shows this is from um washington post okay and let's go back because i only have a couple more slides left i want to hurry up and get through this rest of this presentation i didn't plan to be here this long uh we need to use studies like this one here from citigroup bank um this came out uh, cbsnews.com had an article dealing with this and i talked about this when this came out i did a, a hour and a half uh broadcast on it racism has cost the u.s 16 trillion dollars citigroup fines here's a, a excerpt of the uh, article Racism has cost the U.S. $16 trillion. America could have been $16 trillion richer if not for inequities in education, housing, wages, and business investment between uh, black and white Americans over the past 20 years, new research concludes. The study released this week by Citigroup, this came out in September 2020, by Citigroup Bank is the latest in a body of research that attempts to quantify the economic impact of systemic racism. So this study shows how racism is hurting everyone, even though African Americans get the brunt of the harm. Citigroup arrived at a $16 trillion figure after estimating three major things. One, black workers had $113 billion in potential wages over the past two decades because they could not get a college degree. Two, the housing market lost $218 billion, $218 billion in sales because black applicants could not get home loans. Three, about $13 trillion in business revenue never flowed into the US economy because African-American entrepreneurs could not access bank loans. So what this is showing is, number one, we have to understand what racism is. Racism is not a feeling. Racism is not about hating people. Bigotry is racial hatred. 
Racism is a power structure. Racism is a system of advantage and privilege distributed based upon race, which comes out of an ideology of European white supremacy for the purpose of preserving genetic white survival. Racism occurs when one race of people control the majority of the wealth, power, resources, privileges, benefits, land, access to education, access to opportunity, and they use this to, marginally, to, to marginalize and subordinate and do harm to another race of people. It's the power structure. That's what racism is, okay? All right, so the study from Citigroup lays out these three areas, okay? African Americans uh, couldn't get a, uh, not able to get a college degree, lost $113 billion in potential wages, um, housing market not being able to get homes, $218 billion in sales. The housing market loses $218 billion in sales and about $13 trillion in business revenue never flowed into the U.S. economy because African-American entrepreneurs could, get, could not get access to bank loans. Now, something very important to understand when you, when you read this study. They're not talking about over 246 years. They're not talking about over 400 years. They're talking about a 20 year period of time. The U.S. economy lost 16 trillion dollars. They're looking at from about tw about the year 2000 to 2019. About a 20 year period of time. The article goes on to say what's more. The U.S. could have five trillion dollars in gross domestic product over the next five years if those gaps and others were closed today the study indicated so what they're doing that they're, they're talking about the need for policy to address these structural inequities that policy created just giving a check don't correct the structural inequities the laws and policies will still be there but it's showing how it's better for everybody if you create these structural inequities and in how the U.S. economy can grow. So we have to understand with 13 and a half percent of the population, the narrative that we show how these policies that we're advocating for will also benefit the majority population because most of the people who have to vote for these policies are not African-American. Let's be honest, most of them are white. And then there's a backlash that will come even in, say, cities. We have a majority population. Lawsuits are still going to be filed. So you're going to have to build allies. And you want to show how these policies are really good for everybody to reduce the backlash, to reduce the number of lawsuits. And whatever policies are put in, pay, put in place, pass city council, et cetera, you have to make sure that you're on strong legal footing. So that whatever gets passed does not get overturned in the courts. Some of this stuff is going to go to the U.S. Supreme Court. You don't know what a 6-3 conservative Supreme Court as a result of Donald Trump, Senator Mitch McConnell, Republicans having control of the Senate going back to 2014 and during the, uh, during the, uh, the, Trump, uh, the Trump administration. And the Heritage Foundation and the Federalist Society that supplied Donald Trump with list of potential federal judge nominations, and Supreme Court justices. That came from the Heritage Foundation and the Federalist Society. Go research them. And then go study Project 2025 from the Heritage Foundation while you're at it. I don't have time to get into that. We've already done three hours, two hours longer than I planned to be here. Luckily, this is our 14th year anniversary, so, you know, I have a little time on my hands. Um... So you have that and policies that are good for African-Americans are good for America in general. Policies that are good for African-Americans are good for America in general. When I was on the panel discussion for the um, Kerner Commission report back in, I think it was April 2023. In preparation for that, they sent us a clip from CNN. It was a segment on CNN dealing with uh, the Kerner Commission report, and it was like the anniversary of it. 
Uh, and they had they had an interview with the last remaining person who was on it was 11 uh member commission and this guy was a senator is a uh, a white gentleman who was a, a u.s senator and I, for, I forgot his name um he was talking about how he agreed with the findings from the current commission report and he said he was explaining this to his father and his father was, he said, his father said something to the effect of, so you mean to tell me that you're going to raise my taxes to pay for programs for black people in the inner city? And his father said, you know, he didn't want that, even though he knew the history that the Kerner Commission report laid out was correct and the conditions that was accurate and all that. When it's presented as we're going to raise your taxes to pay for these programs for black people. You're going to lose 11 times out of 10. That's not how to present this. If you want to lose, that's how you do that. If you want to lose, put the term reparations on these policies, especially at the federal level, the House of Representatives, U.S. Senate, you're going to lose 11 times out of 10. As, lo as long as white people, the majority population and you 2020 U.S. Census. 50 white people, 57 percent of the population. And that was the first time that the population of white people dropped below 60 percent since 1790. Since the, since the first census was taken in 1790. So a lot of this backlash and people supporting Donald Trump, white people supporting Donald Trump, the ones that do, a lot of this is the fear of the browning of America and the fear that some white people have of becoming a numerical minority in this country by the year 2043. There was an article, uh, this deals with uh, racial anxiety. There was an article from the... There was one from the Atlantic.com, but I can't find that one right now. So we'll, we'll look at the, we'll look at this one here um, from the Washington Post. Now this one from the Washington Post was a few months before the election. The one I want is was after the election. In 2016 cultural anxiety that's how they put it cultural anxiety okay let's look at this this is the one I really want yeah cultural anxiety same thing is racial anxiety oh, this is this is from May 19th 2017 exhibit we have probably had exhibit Z now all, all the stuff I've shown you this right here This is your last free article. I read so much stuff, you know. And I already have so many um, paid subscriptions. I'm not taking out one to the Atlantic. It was cultural anxiety that drove white working class voters to Trump. Okay. It wasn't, it wasn't the economy. This is from 2017. The, uh, the May, this is from May 9th, 2017. It was cultural anxiety that drove white working class voters to Trump. A new study finds that fear of societal change, not economic pressure, motivated votes for the press for Donald Trump among non-salaried workers without college degrees. This is this explains how a lot of auto workers. A lot of white auto workers, especially white male auto workers, supported Donald Trump in 2016, even though Donald Trump was against the unions. He was against the UAW. He was uh, he was against uh, when when uh, President Obama 
and Joe Biden and Congress bailed out uh, General Motors and Chrysler, Trump was against the bailout. Trump said they should just let those country they, they should just let those companies fail, let them file for bankruptcy. He said those companies should move their plants to the south because in a lot of southern states they don't have unions. He said they should move their plants to the south, okay, where they don't have unions, and then the employees would be forced to take what the companies pay them. Now, this is what Trump said. And some of these dumbasses still voted for him because it was racial anxiety and cultural anxiety. It wasn't economic issues. That's what they were fearing. They, they saw Donald Trump as the great white hope. Okay, so read the read this piece here from um, the Atlantic. All right, let's see. Uh, let me go back. I think I have one more slide, and that's it. Bantu Stephen Biko, one of our great South African freedom fighters, who was portrayed by Denzel Washington in the 1987 movie *Craft Freedom*. He said the most potent weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. We must take our minds back and we do not ask permission to do so. We just take it back. So hopefully you learned a lot from this presentation. Uh, Santi Sana, Mad Hotep, Wakanda forever. Hopefully, hopefully you learned a lot from this in-depth presentation. Uh, if you want me to do a presentation for your group or organization, you can email me at uh, AHN show at the African History Network .com. If you want me to do a presentation for your group organization, email me at AHN show at the African History Network .com or at African History Network .com because I own both domains. Uh, if you want to interview me or have me do a presentation for your group organization, you can support the African History Network. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App, also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. And we have the information right on the homepage of our website as well. Uh, give us a thumbs up, give us a heart, give us a like on this broadcast. I know it was long, there's a lot of information to get through. I wanted to make sure I got through all of my slides. It was even more, it was even longer putting together all this information. How do you think I feel? Um, <laughs> it was even a lot more work putting together this information than it is to actually go through it. And be sure to register for the online history courses that I teach on uh, Saturdays, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade. We deal with thousands of years of history and uh, what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. Uh, we have the, in digital download format, we have a 15 lecture bundle of mine. Uh, this has 15 uh, of my presentations, digital download format. This is on sale, $75. It's listed here. It's right on the homepage of our website when you scroll down, but it lists all the, the lectures that you get. Okay, so you can download these and and keep them you don't have to uh, uh wait on me to ship dvds if you want it in dvd format is a hundred dollars it's a 150 dollar value okay that is um african history awakens the african mind for mental death that is a, a digital download bundle pack that i put together African history awakens the African mind for mental death. So it's 15 of my lectures on all different topics. The film Black Panther, Dr. King, Malcolm X, African history, uh, politics, six principles of political self-defense, how policy impact economic conditions of African-Americans, the 13 forms of wealth keys to entrepreneurship and economic empowerment. Uh, First Americans were Africans documented evidence. That's actually a double lecture I deal with Dr. David M. Hotep here in Detroit. Um, so it's a, it's a lot that you get here. Great African women in history, the mothers of civilization. That's a four-hour presentation. So we have that at our website. 
but the uh what i was looking for is right here this deals with uh our online history class and it's a visual class we deal with uh 80 to 100 articles there's 200 um there's uh 200 slides over 200 slides in the class 80 to 100 articles i put together this class put uh, developed the curriculum there are 15 books that we reference. You don't have to buy any of the books to follow along in class. I'll show you excerpts of the book, of the books on the screen. Uh, the video clips of interviews I've done with uh, historians like Professor Jane Small, Professor Kaba Hiawatha Kamene, Tony Browder, Renoka Rashidi, and more. So uh, we teach the class Saturdays. Next classes are Saturdays, March 16th, March 23rd, March 30th, April 6th. And we have some sessions after that. 2 p.m. Uh, we usually go to about 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Click right here to register for the classes on sale, $80. Even after the course is over with, you can go back and watch the entire uh, class. So it's you don't lose access to it. The content is PG-13, so you can use this with your children also. Okay. All right. So thanks for tuning in to this um, 14th year anniversary of the uh, African History Network show. Um, first started March 10th, uh, March 10th, 2010. So time has gone by quickly. It's um, been a lot of work and interviewed a ton of people. Um, so we'll have uh, open lines next Probably next Sunday, we'll have open lines through our blog talk radio channel for people to call in um, this for this show. I had to get through this presentation. I had a lot to cover. All right. So but it's been a great ride and uh, learned a lot. Uh, spoken in different cities. Uh, There's a lot of work also. So you can help support us if you like this type of information, if you learned anything today. Um, we definitely need your support as well and register for the online uh, history classes. OK. All right. Remember, right now is correct. Your own behavior is not over till we win. We're kind of forever. And we'll talk to you next time. Peace.